Hey everyone, welcome to this Wednesday's release of the show where we're talking about Bitcoin. Today's guest is a friend, entrepreneur, and fellow Bitcoiner, Jay Gold. Jay has been a tech entrepreneur for more than two decades, and on today's show, we get into a detailed conversation about many of those experiences that shaped his thinking on founding, building, and selling businesses. The last tech business that he sold, he sold for $33 million, and today he's an active venture capitalist and a Bitcoiner. For the first half of the interview, we cover his lessons learned, trials and tribulations with raising money from billionaires like Reid Hoffman and much, much more. And then in the second half, we cover his thoughts on Bitcoin and how he thinks about it as an investment in his overall portfolio. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with Jay. He's just so open and candid with what he knows and what he's learned through the years. And so it's just an incredible lesson for people to kind of hear from this firsthand experience of all these different businesses that he's created through the years. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in with Jay Gold. Jay, welcome to the show. I'm pumped to talk to you. I love talking to entrepreneurs, so I'm excited to do this, man. I'm excited to be on. Thanks for bringing me on. I, I guess let's start here. My understanding is that you started your very first website business whenever you were in college. My, I guess my question for you is, are you a self-taught programmer? Were you outsourcing the code base to somebody else? Just give us some insights on how you got your start with your very first company. Believe it or not, it wasn't programming. People always think I'm a programmer. I wasn't a programmer. Yeah. I had these ideas. I, I use the internet just like everybody else. I'm, I'm a power user. You see me on Clubhouse and stuff. And and all these other things. And um, I saw my behavior and I've always felt I'm very average. I don't think I'm any different than anybody else. I think most people are just very similar to each other. And uh, by the way, when you go down a path in school on um, like for pre-law, you take a lot of psychology classes and sociology and that kind of stuff too, right? And so you understand the mindset of people by taking these types of classes a little bit. So when I started to use the internet, I thought I was using like AOL and the chat rooms, like the early days in the 90s, you know? And I was like, you know, I think this is going to be really big because of the way I felt using it. I was compelled and sucked in and drawn into this. It was addictive to me. It was like playing a video game. I was a big gamer as a kid. And I was like, you know, I think this is a thing, you know? And this was like late 90s in college, right? I graduated in 01. So in like 97, 98, 99, I'm, I'm having some friends that I met in like CS classes and shit that were programmers. And I really didn't have the bug for that. I wasn't really into it, but I was into wanting to build. I really wanted to build something that people wanted to use. And I saw the opportunity to build something where it could be massively scaled before I even thought of the term scale, just lots of people using it. you know. And I just knew how I felt about using these products. And I thought I could draw people in if we added certain types of features, this, that, and the other thing. So the first thing I built early days was not social, believe it or not. I was into e-commerce kind of websites, selling things and yeah. all that kind of stuff. You know, SEM, SEO. Learned that. That was a good foundational base right, for the marketing side of it. Understood the users. And when I started to get into like building social media sites, that was the first thing I really did after the e-commerce stuff to make a little money. Uh, the first thing I did was I built a dating site. And I built that site and had a real early success there. Sold that probably like 2003, I guess. Were you hiring the programmers or what were you doing? <laughs> You could do that back then. Today, I say to people, my path, that the way I went, I, I don't think you could replicate that path. Today, everybody who's a good programmer and the way the world is with the 0% interest rates, you know, we'll probably go in and out of like Bitcoin, as you said, with the 0% interest rates today, money's almost free. So if you're a good, talented developer, you don't need to work for me. Just go yeah. get money from somebody and build it yourself. Yeah. You have your own company. That was not the case in the late 90s, right? People didn't understand how to raise money. It wasn't widely available. There wasn't YouTube yet. There wasn't blogs, like people like Naval Ravikant teaching people how to raise money and how a term sheet works and all this kind of stuff. So we've democratized the information for people to freely understand how to do this, which is great because we're getting better products and lots of companies are being created and amazing things come out of that. But when I did it, it was not as competitive as it is today. So when I started to do it, I could hire people to work for me and not even pay them a lot of money, right? People find people in India and Pakistan and all parts of the world through like Elance and stuff like that. And that's what I did. In the beginning, it was kids in college that I knew. And then over time, I found people through the internet and became friends with these guys and still friends with over 20 years with some of these people. And we built some of the earlier stuff together. Yeah, it's funny. I know whenever I was just starting my business, I used Elance a lot. And it was almost like a cheat code that mm -hmm. nobody else out there was really. <laughs> and I think, what was it? Odesk bought them. I don't, yeah. I don't, I think if you search for Elance right now, it won't even take you to that site, but I just remember using it and just being like, wow, like I can get 
like deliverables, like digital deliverables for just unbelievable prices. That's fascinating. So you're building these sites, you're probably, you're flipping them, you're selling them, but like not for a lot of money, like a couple no. thousand here and there and just kind of. The Raider Date was the first one I sold. I had a body jewelry website. I had a lot of other stuff that I didn't sell. I was just making money on. But on Raider Date, I copied Hot or Not. I'm actually friends with the founder of Hot or Not, James Hong. Now I am. Back then, I copied him. You know? yeah. But he had Hot or Not. And actually on his website, he had a link at the bottom. I think it was called Copycat Sites or something like that. And that was one of the copies. There was like tons of like, rate this or that, rate my car, rate my prom dress, rate my dog cat. And then I had Raider Date, which was a little bit more directly competitive to what they were doing, but they were obviously the best, him and Jim, you know? And it did really well. Like it was a free thing when online dating was still paid. And it seemed ridiculous to me that you would pay a membership for dating when you when I could create it for free and monetize it through advertising. I was like, this is not sustainable for match.com. What a little did I know. They're they're, they're huge companies today, right? But back then, 20 years ago, I was like, that's not sustainable. Like if I could offer this for free through advertise ad support, I know I'll make less money than if I had a subscription base, but I'll I'll have a place in the world and I'll compete and siphon off some of their customer base, right? And that's what I did. And so I got to like maybe a hundred thousand members and I sold it to MatchNet PLC, which I think is now Spark Networks. They own AmericanSingles.com, J Date, and a bunch of these dating sites. So there's a guy named Pud, that's his nickname, Pud.com is his is his blog, Philip Kaplan. He started AdBright and he now runs the largest music distribution service on the web, which is called DistroKid. And in the early days, he created before like even Instagram was was around, I think it was called Mobog. He had like this mobile, before it had iPhone apps and stuff, right? Before the even iPhone, he had like a mobile app uploading site for photos, believe it or not, right? Really cool. And um, he sold a site through eBay, which was like, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So I listed it on eBay, on eBay. within days. Yeah. I li- but I didn't sell it on eBay. I listed it. I got all this inbound. I took the listing down and then I negotiated and I sold it. So it was, I saw what he did. This guy's a smart guy. I'm always tracking some of the guys in the industry. And uh, I said, you know, that, that's a good idea. Let me, let me see if I list it. And if there's, a, and all of a sudden, like this big company reaches out and they were like, they didn't even know about me. Right. And they're like, how are these guys getting these numbers? And they verify the numbers and we negotiated and we, sold, and we sold it. I didn't get rich or anything off of it, but it did show me that there's a there, there, there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I was like, holy cow, I got to run with this, you know? And so then I built another social network, which was socialtree.com. People never heard of this, but socialtree.com was competing with like Friendster back in the day, right? So Raider Date was kind of pre Friendster or right around that time. Back then, there were like, we used to call them profile sites. There was Black Planet, there was Asia Magenta, there was MySpace, there was Friendster, there was facethejewelry.com, the dilly.com. There was all these like kind of profile sites, right? You go and you create a little profile. It was kind of, there were social networks, but nobody was calling it that yet, you know? And so I thought, well, the dating thing, it's like the stigma was hard to get people to join because of the stigma of dating and not everybody's looking to date, right? I was like, but I do think like the early days of AOL chat rooms, I do think people want to just hang out and communicate. I think generally people are kind of bored and looking for community and connection. I saw that early on. And so I built Social Tree. We built a little audience and I was trying to compete with Friendster. Then Friendster got beat by MySpace, as we all know, because we hear it all the time at Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin the next MySpace, right? So, but it's not. We can get into that. But the long story short is that I saw that there was a there there with Raider Day. I created Social Tree. And with Social Tree, it actually introduced me to the biggest idea I've ever had. So we were now competing with Friendster and moving towards competing with MySpace. And MySpace allowed, if you remember, you to customize the CSS, the style sheets and stuff of your page. You can change the colors and embed things. So we said, well, that's cool. We should do that too. If that's what kids want to do, we should do that. I was a kid too then. And so we did it. And a kid took a video. And he embedded it into his profile and he sourced the source equals from a video file that he found somewhere else somewhere and he pulled else, it yeah. into the video player. Yeah. And I said, wow, it's really smart. Embedded. And my programmer, <laughs> yeah, he, he embedded it in, right? And, and it was just like you could do for an image, right? And he insourced it in with the video. And I was like, that's really cool how he did it because he had like a Windows media player and he sourced in the source equals file. I was like, it's really genius. And my programmer was like, we should take it down because of copyright. And I was like, no, obviously this is cool. We're fascinated by it. I'm looking at his video. I thought it was kind of cool. You weren't even hosting the video. You just had the reference. The way he did it, he had the, that's right. And then when we first did it, by the way, that website that I'm about to tell you about, that was called Music Video Codes. This is not rocket science here at Preston, right? So I'm looking at the HTML code and I'm like, it's a music video. Let's call it Music Video Codes. (laughs) (laughs) And if you go to like Google, what are they called? Trends, I think, where you can see like search terms and stuff. Yeah. Music Video Codes is like flat. And then there was a moment in time like flying way up and then it came down. It was like insanely popular in the mid 2000s. 
That led me to building a video sharing site because when I put all the music videos uploaded to the site and gave everybody the codes so they can embed that code. Now you're switching and now you're hosting. That's right. Yes. So I gave everybody every music video that's ever been created. We created a directory. Everything's there. And I thought, well, this will help Social Tree become really popular. We'll have the two sister sites and you speak yeah, people yeah, yeah. in and we'll get them coming from MySpace, but then we're like cross promote my social net. That was my, my master plan was to be like what Facebook is today. I was like, oh, you know, I never thought it'd be that big, but I thought it'd be a big thing. And what ended up happening is we started to bring people in and music video codes just took off and nobody ever clicked the other link to go to social train. It just was going like within a, a couple of days, it was thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and then millions. We ended up getting over 40 million views a day in 2005. My God. This is before YouTube existed, right? Wow. So, and the story goes, and I'll tell you the inside story, and I'd love to hear Chad or Steve tell me something different. Copy me. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> because I was out first. And I know it's true because one of my investors, uh, my previous, another company I had was Reed Hoffman, the founder. Of yeah. Yeah. And, and so Reed told me that those guys squatted in the offices of LinkedIn because they used to work for him when he worked at PayPal. They were junior guys, right? They were like graphic designers and programmers. And so they came over and they were like, can we use some space? And, uh, and they had like a dating thing first. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> they had a dating thing for YouTube. And then it kind of converted over and became a video. They had the technology, but they converted over to video sharing. And in the very early days, I was the only one to allow you to upload the video, give you a code, and then take that code and embed it on a third-party site. I was the first one to do that. It wasn't very long after that that people started to say, well, if he can do it, it must not be not profitable. So there's got to be a way to monetize this. How was he able to do that? So that's what we were doing. So we kind of like showed everybody. And I got to tell you, I sat down with a spreadsheet, dude, and I modeled this out for like days and days and days. And I was like, I was worried that like this would scale and then I would just like rack up server bills and be out of business real quick, right? Like I'm not gonna be able to pay this stuff. And it was a little worrisome for the first like month or two because you're waiting on checks from ad networks and stuff. I was really worried. I, I maxed out credit cards. I started getting credit cards and like applying for 2,000 here, 5,000. And I was just like paying for all the servers and stuff at SoftLayer and the planet. And I was racking up. I had like mm, 65, $75,000 in debt before any checks came in. And this and is I'm just like, all for server space. Yeah. This wow. was all operational cost. Oh it was crazy God. how fast it scaled. It, it scaled fast. And my thing was this. At the beginning, I was very nervous. But I thought to myself, before I pulled the trigger, I said, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is it, these, these server bills go crazy, which is not a bad thing. It means you have scale and you have, you have traction. People care, right? The worst thing is that the advertising networks don't pay me and I go bankrupt. But then I thought about it and I was like, but I am bankrupt. When you really think about it, everybody listening to this, you're already bankrupt for the most part, right? <laughs> Unless you're already rich, right? But most people, they just don't know they are. You have a job, right? You have income and you have expenses like a mortgage and a car payment. And, and, but yeah. like you're effectively, you owe everything yeah. to the bank. They own everything. You don't own anything, right? So take a risk. Worst can happen is you wipe it out and seven years from now, you start over, right? And I got over that really quick. I was like, if it doesn't work out, I'm so young. I was like early 20s. What's the worst that could happen? Before I'm even 30, I'll be back to fine. You know? Yeah. And so I just took the I took the bet and it and it scaled really fast. And then I ended up selling that company to a company in New York City because is this once bolt? I hit scale, is this, bolt? this is bolt yeah. that bought it. Yeah. Once I hit scale, like tens of millions of people, I didn't realize, but like, and I was a young kid in my mid early to mid 20s. Everybody started calling me, like Benchmark Capital, Sequoia, like all these venture capitalists. I, I didn't even know what venture capital was. Right? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. who are these guys? They're analysts that work there, you know? And they're all like, we'd love to get a meeting with you. I'm like, how do they even know who we are? Where are they finding me? Like, are they on these websites and they found my website and they, but we don't have a phone number. I'm like, how do they even get my phone? It was really weird, right? But they know what they're doing. So I was really afraid. And then companies started to call, we'd like to buy you. And, so it sounds to me yeah. like they were, uh, they were getting their queuing from the hosting companies. That's probably the only way that they would be able to know. Uh, they're probably pinging these hosting companies saying, hey, who, which websites are just growing like crazy and how can we get the, the number of... What I didn't know, I know now, but I didn't, they were using Comscore Nielsen. And so I was showing up number one for music and number one for entertainment and, and video and stuff. I was like number one on Comscore. And they're like, wow. who is this site? We never heard of these guys. So everybody wants to invest in this thing that comes out of nowhere and it's really fast. Yeah. Really. Right. So, so everybody contacted me and, and I, I just didn't understand venture capital, like from a very young kid, like didn't, you know, I didn't go to school for economics or finance. I was like, it sounded like they wanted something out of me and I was going to get the raw end of that deal. Cause I didn't know how to negotiate it. But when the guys came in with offers to buy it, that was a different story, right? It was like, okay, sense of ownership, control, 
these guys were talking about board seats, two to one, and it was crazy and like preferred dividends. And there was all kinds of terms I didn't understand. And again, like I said earlier, the Navabs of the world didn't exist on these blogs like Venture Hacks to teach anybody this stuff in like 2005, right? So how would you know? And I wasn't in that circle. So Gorilla Nation, stupidvideos.com, bolt.com. There was, there was a lot of these kind of like mid-size internet companies that had raised some funding and stuff like that, had investors. They understood that game better than me. And the founders of Bolt were very close. It was New York City. I live in Jersey. I'm not that far from them. Lou Kerner, who started .TV and sold it for, I think, $100 million. Aaron Cohen, who was the founder of Bolt.com. And Bolt.com was founded in 1996 as the first social network. So I'm like, all right, these guys, they know what they're doing. So I said, well, what's the deal? So I negotiated a deal for an equity deal. I didn't get very much cash on that transaction, but I came a third partner with Lou and Aaron. And I thought to myself, I'm a third partner with these guys. This guy sold a company for 100 million. He used to work at Goldman Sachs. And stuff. They, built, they went to Ivy League schools like Columbia and they went to Stanford. And I'm like, this is like way out of my league, right? So my dad, who's a carpenter, my stepdad, he said, at the time, he's like, what are you crazy? There's a guy offering you $2 million in cash. Take the cash. And I'm going with Lou and Aaron. And I'm like, I'm not taking the cash. I'm going with these guys. He's like, you're crazy. Like, you know, my dad's not rich. And he's like, take the money. And I'm like, if I take that $2 million, I'm going to pay taxes. I'm left with a million dollars to buy a house. What do I, I got to go find a job? No, I don't think so. I'd rather, go to, I'd rather go to school. And for me, I wanted to go become a student of Aaron and Lou. And, and I did. Yeah. And I built, yeah. I, I built a network through these guys too. Like I, just, I didn't think that at the time I'd build a network, but I built a network very quickly. Credibility, authority, network. You know, That's what I did. And so I sold to them. We kept scaling. YouTube eventually surpassed us. They beat us, right? They came out of nowhere and they, they kind of beat us. It's a whole different story. And then we got sued by Universal Music. So, and because of the earlier days of, <laughs> of music video codes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came back to haunt us <laughs> and so, it killed the company. Jay, leading up to all this, you have lightning in a bottle. It's scaling, it's exploding. And so a person who's listening to this, they're, they're sitting there looking at themselves and they're saying, how can I replicate this? So what in any of this was replicable versus just kind of being the guy who's in the right spot at the right time sure. that has, and I don't want to take away from the situation that, that you created because you worked extremely hard to grow this, but like what is replicable or what would you say the takeaway is for somebody listening to this who's, who's inspired by the story and wants to do some of the same for themselves? I would say that some of it's luck. I would say it's people. I think success is, is a function of, in my opinion, having opportunities available. A lot of people don't have opportunities. Like if I was born in Kenya, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this, right? So opportunities are important, right? And even if you're in the US, there's different opportunities in different parts of the country, different socioeconomic backgrounds, all this kind of stuff. So opportunities are available to a lot of people that I had, very similar opportunities that I've had to probably millions of people, right? So it wasn't very unique in that sense. It was like I was born with a silver spoon. But then you got to make the right choices, Preston. And that's a function of having pattern recognition, in my opinion, and good instincts and intuition, which is based through your experiences growing up. And so for me, I think there was just, and, and I call that a little bit of luck. You sprinkle a luck right there. You got opportunities, making the choices, and then you need a little bit of luck. I think the lightning in the bottle is a good way to describe music video codes. But then from there, you have to then be able to have that pattern recognition to know the adapt and evolve and the iteration of building a product to scale. Because it's not like you had that one thing and then it was like, it, there's a lot. I'm oversimplifying things. It took months and months for us to get to a product market fit before I even know what product market fit was, you know, and Eric Rise and his book and, you know, Lean Startup, that, none of that existed back then. You kind of just figured all, I was in his generation. It is all of us figuring this out on the fly. So for those listening to try to figure it out, you got to be able to see what's happening in the market, see what's happening in your life, understand the way people work from a psychological perspective when you're doing social, because it is all about the mind. And then you have to be able to build a product around that. You really recognize the technological change that was happening as a young kid. You're like, hey, yeah. this internet thing is going to be huge, right? So when you look across the landscape today, what do you see out there from a technological standpoint that would be akin to this that's happening right now? Well, I met you on Clubhouse <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I think audio, I don't know if it's going to be Clubhouse, but I think drop in audio, whether it's going to be on Twitter for spaces or something. I think that's the next movement. It's surprising in many ways. I had the opportunity to meet Ev Williams, the founder of blogger.com, Medium, and Twitter, co-founder of Twitter, back in 2006, December of 2006, introduced at a party. And uh, somebody said, go ask him about this Twitter thing. He was running a podcasting platform called Odeo. He started Blogger, sold it to Google, pre-IPO, I think he sold it to them, 
grab you Google, obviously. He starts Odeo next. And then he goes with his investors and says, I'm going to return the capital because it's not working out. And I don't think the world's quite ready for audio, but mm-hmm. I actually think we have something else we built, which they used internally to communicate, which I guess was, was Jack Dorsey. I think we created it for him because he was working for Odeo. I th- if I remember the story correctly. So he creates this and they were communicating internally using it, I guess. And they were like, we, th- we like this. So I talked to Ev at this party and I said, well, describe this to me. And this is 06. Pre iPhone. Imagine understanding. I was just thinking that Twitter's Twitter, going to scale before, yeah, uh, before an app. <laughs> yeah, it's like a web-based product, right? And his description of it was really interesting. And he was kind of a, you know, like a typical programmer tech guy. He was a little awkward, you know? And he's like, well, you go to Twitter, you sign up, create an account. I was like, okay. He goes, and then, uh, you know, you go on your phone and you go on your contacts and you add a short code. I was like, what's a short code? He's like, it's, it's like this, I forget how many digits, but five or six digits, like 404040. I was like, okay. He goes, name it Twitter. I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of friction here. I'm like, who's doing all this, right? But I'd say that to him. I'm like, okay. And then when you do that, every time somebody that you follow on, once you go back to the website, you start following your friends or people you like, and they follow you. <laughs> and you just, when you send something out to that short code, they'll receive the text message. And I'm like, so isn't this like, I said this to him, I go, isn't this kind of like almost like a group test messaging? He goes, yeah, I guess it is like group texting. I was like, okay, so why do I need to use Twitter? I was so confused, right? And he's like, well, maybe you don't. I was like, okay, you're giving all the money back for Odeo to your investors. Because one this. of the investors told me, I think he came out of pocket to make them whole on what he spent, if I'm not mistaken. You're giving all the money back. And then you're saying, if you want to invest in this other thing, you obviously see something here. What are you seeing that I'm not hearing? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And he's like, he goes, I don't know, maybe we're just drinking the Kool Aid or something like that. And I was like, so that's when you want to ask even more questions. <laughs> I had to leave, right? I walk over to Reed. I think it was Reed and Josh Compliment. I walk over and they're like, what did you think? I think you should just take your money back. <laughs> <Just run. laughs> Worst advice ever. <laughs> Things like a $15, $20 billion company, right? But how could you know without this is the yeah, difference yeah, between yeah. great entrepreneurs, Ev's obviously a great entrepreneur, and I'm a good entrepreneur, right? But he's unbelievable. And they can see that, that vision in the future. And I could see it. I've been good at that several times. We can go through a couple of those, like social network, online video sharing, video ad networks, things like that. But he's been hitting it every time. And every one of these companies are like billion dollar companies. So he was able to envision that it's probably going to, he probably envisioned it's going to go to mobile in the future. And I couldn't understand that. You know, I mean, he was talking about mobile, but he's talking about it from a text message perspective. And I think in his mind, it's like, we think about Bitcoin. It's only going to get better. This isn't yeah. the end of the road. He's envisioning like the growth story in the future, the secular growth trend of internet usage and adoption and speed of the internet, which I did with online video desktop, right? When I was doing the video sharing site, everybody was like, oh, most people don't have broadband. I'm like, but the penetration growth numbers are going up when you look at Forrester and stuff. They were seeing it in application there as a messaging within their company. And it's completely yeah. different when you're seeing something versus somebody just explaining. Like he was just telling me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah I didn't yeah. use the product. And literally, yeah. I, if you look at my account, I think I joined a few months after he, I didn't even join that day, right? So if you look at my account, I think it was like March of 07 or something like that. And I wow. met him in December of 06. So early, early days, I was like, oh, really interesting. And, but I, I stopped you. I wasn't even using it that much, you know? But then, I, I, you know what I thought Twitter was like, what it is today? When I saw Ashton Kutcher join. Yeah. Then I was like, ah, I get it. This is a broadcasting platform for famous people. This yeah. is not a communication tool for the average person. Although most we're on here and you see all like the Bitcoin plebs and stuff and they have like 50 followers and they're adding you and you head them back. But like, it can't be as enjoyable for you who has like 250,000 followers. You put out, you get great feedback right away. Well, you get you know, access to somebody you'd never have access to. And you, that's can, true. you can have interactions with people that you would never have interactions with. 100%. Which is why, to your question, what's next is why I really love the audio because it's more context. It's not a tweet and a meme. You could send it out. And then if you say something like Bitcoin Tina, right? Let's talk about Tina, right? So Tina comes on Clubhouse and he says these inflammatory, crazy things. And he does the same thing on Twitter. He acts the same way on Clubhouse, but nobody actually does the follow up question with him. They love how he acts, right? Because he's like a character. It's high band. Yeah. I pissed him off the other day. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, you always ask so many questions. And I was like, isn't that why we're here? I'm not here to listen to you do a diatribe and then not question what you're saying. Yeah. He was saying something and I was like, well, explain why. And he's like, well, it's because of this. I go, but you didn't really explain it. Can you go in a little deeper? And then he tried to say something very high level. And then I go, no, no, no. Because I'm not like everybody else that just listens to him. I'm like, I'm really just trying to understand what you're saying. In Twitter, he would tweet it and you could ask him and he could just ignore it. But on Clubhouse, you're pressed. I want to yeah. ask you and you got it. And so that's why I love the audio. Because we can have a conversation, you can really learn from people. It's the equivalent, I would say the equivalent of like listening to a radio station versus like high def 
TV, where Twitter right now is like you can put out a little, you know, a little tweet, and it's text. There's it's really hard to understand the context. It's hard to understand the confidence in the person's voice, right? Like you're not yeah. hearing any of that. You get on Clubhouse right. or you get on what do they call it on Twitter? Spaces. By the way, you should be doing spaces. I, I you know, got like man, so much. Just, you'd I'm be just, getting like ten thousand people in these rooms. <laughs> I guess I'm just too lazy to do it. Like, I just, <laughs> I think that's uh, what it is. Honest with you, I've done it a few times. It's been good. Let I've me enjoyed, know. Ping me when you do it. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed the conversations. It's just I don't know. I see people doing it all the time, and I'm just like, oh god, I just yeah. Don't, too much is too much. Bro. I don't yeah, want to yeah. do that right now. I'm just <laughs> I just want to sit down and just like kind of relax and have a bourbon or something. <laughs> hey, so. Let's go back to the legal piece of this. So you've done the Music Video Codes website. You have to know that like you're in that gray space, right? Like I'm yeah. onboarding like would you say 40 million a day, which is well, we were getting like <laughs> 5 to 10,000 uploads of videos a day in 2005. It was crazy. crazy. And I think at some point it peaked at like maybe 50,000 plus it or something. And uh, the number of people viewing the videos throughout the web, like virally, right, was 40 million a day. Yeah. You got all that going on. And, and you have to be in the back of your mind saying, okay, so I'm getting a lot of traction. I'm probably getting a lot of traction because I'm on this cusp of a legal battle potentially with these content creators that are making the music and the videos that are being hosted there. So, what were you doing leading up to the, the lawsuit, right? to protect yourself or to guard against this. Just walk us through kind of the thought sure. process, especially with your background. You know, you got this background yeah. in, in law, right? So two things. Number one, I actually wasn't so sure that I was breaking any copyright laws because I looked into this and we'll fast forward from what I'm saying. About two years later, I sat down with Wendy McGrath, the CEO of MTV Networks. And so what I suspected was actually true because I Googled and did all these searches and I talked to lawyers and I couldn't find a license agreement for video, music videos. I could find it for audio music, but I couldn't find it for music, right? For, like sorry, videos. music video. Yeah. Yeah. You can't find music video licensing agreements anywhere. They didn't exist in 2004 and 5. So I thought, is it promotional value? Because they do call them promotional videos. And, and the interesting part was you have labels that are major labels. You have the Universals and the Sonys and the EMIs and the, the largest, the big four. And they have smaller labels underneath each of those. And those smaller labels found out who we were too. And they would send, it was so funny, there's like old school stuff. They would send you CDs of their new artists and they would give you on the CDs, their music videos. Please put this on your website. Meanwhile, a few years later, their parent label suing me. <laughs> and they're giving me the stuff and saying, please put it on the website. So they're not even communicating left hand, right hand. Wow. Right? So I didn't even think it was necessarily illegal because I couldn't find anywhere that there's licensing. There was, there's no one. But at some point before I even sold the company, Universal reached out to me and they said, "We don't have a licensing agreement for this, but we need to put one. That, we, we need to put one in place with you because the scale of it, right?" And I was like, "That doesn't make sense if you don't have it." And they were like, "Yeah, well, we we need to define something." So they gave me a licensing agreement. I said, "Well, how am I going to pay licensing fees for all the stuff that's on other websites? The stuff that's on my website, I can track, but I, I don't." I kind of lied. I was like, "I don't really know how many views those are." Right? Oh, you're we saying for the cookies. embedded? You're saying for the embedded plays? I got you. I mean, I knew exactly what we had, but I was like, I don't really know that. So, but I know what's on my website because I could track it with a pixel on the page. But if the video gets taken somewhere else, and they were like, Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So we signed a contract. I had an agreement with them that I only pay for the licensing on a CPM basis on the website, on my website. But if, right? it, but if it got put in some else. other player, okay. They said, We'll deal with that later. We'll make them pay for the licensing <laughs> when your video gets embedded. <laughs> They're going to have to contact all these websites. I go, Oh, that's fine. You know? So I'm thinking, It's way bigger off my site than on my site, right? <laughs> I was paying them thousands, I don't know, $10,000, $20,000 a month at some point. You know, It was crazy just from the licensing on yeah. our website, yeah. not virally. Just universal. Universal. How Center did they market. know which videos were universal videos versus non-universal videos? I'll ask you a question. How does the IRS know how much money you made last year? It's the same thing. It's self-reported. <laughs> I got it. Got it. <laughs> And they could audit it, right? Like if they wanted to, because under the contract, they could come in, audit the servers, but the and burden look at the of statistics. proof is like crazy. Yeah. yeah, I got you. They were happy to get their twenty thousand dollars a month or whatever these numbers yeah. were, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, so they were like, "Whoa, this is crazy," right? So like they were getting that from any video company, right? For video music videos. So when I sold it to Bolt, I told Lou and Aaron, "I have this licensing agreement. It's in place, but what? We, we got to keep this." They threw it away. They sunset my website. They merged the traffic into Bolt.com. In the two month period, I was the one that ran the product for them. Because I was the product developer guy, kind of, you know, 
my role in the beginning of the company, I think was like VP product when I first came in. Eventually I became the president of the company, but I came in and I basically reshaped the entire social network into a video set, sharing site. So they weren't concerned and, at all. Like they weren't thinking like, I mean, Universal's going to stop seeing the check show up. I said, guys, you can't just not write the check. Like, what are we yeah. doing? Because like weighing it down maybe, but like you can't just cold turkey. Like it's, and within like a year, they filed a lawsuit against us, MySpace, really Fox, because they bought MySpace. So they sued us, Fox, and Sony, their competitor. Sony owned what is now Crackle. Then it was called Grouper, Grouper with an R. So they sued us, the three of them, might have, been, might have a fourth one in there, but they sued the three of us for sure. I mean, if you just Google like bolt.com universal lawsuit, there's all kinds of articles in the Times and Financial Times, New York Times, it was everywhere. Wall Street Journal, it was, it was a big deal. If I'm not mistaken, I want to say it was $150,000 fine per occurrence based on their way they would have done it with the lawsuit. It was, and, and that's, I think it was like a billion dollar plus if we had to pay the fines at the end. It was like, it was not, not so impossible a- to pay. It's a, just a total stop. Everything you pulled down the site or? No, 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 no. They filed the lawsuit like yeah. a year or so later. And then we fought it for a while mm-hmm. and we were just draining and draining. And it was taking all the profitability out of the business. And then it was, then we raised a little bit of money from some angel investors and this fighting, is where fighting Mark came in. You were telling me Mark uh, Cuban yes. came into the mix mm-hmm. here. Mark Cuban, I reached out to Mark on his blog Maverick website. He has like his email. He, anybody could email him. He'll probably write you back. 10 minutes. Like he's pretty cool like that. But I went back and forth and he was writing a lot about YouTube, which I think he was a little salty, to be honest, because he did broadcast.com yeah, yeah. and he sold for 5 billion. And YouTube was like, you know, this traje- and he didn't sell yet when he was talking on his blog all the time. And he's like, there's no model here. And he just didn't like what they were doing. He thought that they were building the business on the backs of, I think, copyrighted content. And he was a copyright owner because he owned the HD, I think HD net was the name of it. You remember he had the TV thing yeah, and the movie yeah. business. He had the movie, movie business with Wagner. Anyway, I think he was a little, frankly, I think he was a little salty in hindsight. I didn't think that at the time. But thank God at the time, because he was like, well, I can help you guys. I know Doug Morris from Universal. I was like, really? And he's like, I can get rid of this, right? And then his, his offer to me was, he goes, but I need to, I, I got to invest. I got to do this for free. And I was like, sure. And he's like, but I got to invest. I want 75%. I'm like, well, how much are you investing? <laughs> it's just like, I t- this is what I want. And it was almost like a blank check the way he was going back and forth in email. We never spoke to him on the phone. This is like weeks and weeks with Mark on emails, like every five minutes. It was like crazy. And he basically came back and he's like, it's 75%. And it's almost like he said it was a blank check. He's like, whatever it takes, I'm obviously going to put the money in. And then we'll, and if it keeps growing, then we'll raise money from VCs and stuff. And I was like, eh. I went back to Lou and Aaron. I couldn't sell it. <laughs> they were like, 75%. This is a 25% between the three of us. And they, they were like, no, we'll take our chances. And it was a bad decision in the end. Well, you don't know what would have happened. Maybe it would have failed with Mark as well. They um, may have. They thought Universal, Doug Moore, CEO of Universal, he said to us on a conference call with the lawyers once, if you Googled Bolt back then, I don't know if you can find it now, they had previously raised $60 million from venture capitalists. I think Highland Capital was the main VC. But they recapped the company before they bought me like a year or two before. Yeah. So they were running out of money after the dot-com crash in 2000, about 2002 or three or four, I forget exactly when. They recapped the company. It was about to go bankrupt. They ran out of money and everything was dying in the, in the internet back in the early 2000s. But Lou and Aaron said, we'll buy it back. And the VC said, sure, if you want to buy it back. So I think they bought it back for like a half a million dollars after they've raised $60 million. Totally recapped the company. The investors are not involved anymore. So when Universal sued us, they were like, oh, and they did the research lawyers. They were like, and they said it on a call with us. They were like, didn't you? It was like, we were going back and forth negotiating. We'll try to figure, find a buyer and this. And, and Doug comes off a of mute once. He's like, this is Doug. Don't you guys have like $60 million raised? Can't we just do a settlement? What the hell's going on here? He's in Highland. Your VCs were like, no, we recapped the company. You could hear a pin drop. <laughs> we're like, hello? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. that, that's unfortunate. And we're like, well, yeah, but like, can't we just work something out? He goes, well, Unfortunately, we're not dropping the lawsuit. You might be a casualty of war here. I'm sorry. I didn't really mean to do that to a private company. He's like, well, he's apologetic about it. He's like, but you know, unfortunately, we're not dropping the lawsuit over this. He hit mute. We never heard his voice ever again. I'm thinking about like, I'm sure you've war game. Like, what could I have done different so that I come out of this with whatever amount? Any amount's better than zero, right? So, you know, thinking about it, would you try to then sell it to Universal if you had to do it all over again? We did try to do that. So what they ended up doing, you might remember, and I can't remember the name. Is this the website? Let me just look real fast, Justin. So what they ended up doing was building Vivo.com. So it was a consortium of all the labels. And just like you saw Hulu for, oh. for, right? They all got together and they did Hulu. I think they did Vivo, if I'm not mistaken. So they were like, we don't need you, right? Yeah, and and yeah, that's, yeah. They, they thought, we own, the, we own the content. We don't need these guys. We yeah. have the content. I'm like, but we have the scale, dude. Well, You're not you going to just get 40 the, million people like that. You have the SEO juice. It's like already in place. 
it was insane that they, they wanted to shut it down. I was like, why don't you just bring it in? And then we, we can make this go in a whole different direction. And and, and they, they had no interest of even giving an offer. I will say this though, when you, yeah, no, not even an offer. It was just like, no, we, they wanted precedent going back to my pre-law degree. They wanted that precedent and we didn't want to give it to them. We ended up shutting the company down through an ABC and assignment for the benefit of creditors. We didn't actually file bankruptcy. We liquidated and whatever was left, everybody got whatever they got. And we did that because we're like, if you're not going to work with us, we're not going to give you the right to just use this lawsuit and, and, a, and a verdict as a precedent for everybody else. So we took <laughs> one for the team being the whole internet. And what ended up happening was Viacom sued Google. It's like war stories. Viacom sued Google for YouTube and Google ended up beating them. And I remember it was like maybe a couple of years after we were done and I was moved on to the next thing. And I remember reaching back after like instant messenger back then to like Aaron or Lou. And I was like, look at this. It was like a 10 K filing. They ended up spending a hundred million dollars defending it at Google. Oh my God. <laughs> hundred million. I was actually happy to see that. I was like, we would have never been able to do that. <laughs> we would try to go the distance. Eventually yeah, it would have been you. inevitable. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Inevitably we would have, we would have gotten shut down. Okay. So let's transition to the company that you founded, uh, Gamers Media, which was then ultimately rebranded as Yashi. This was your really big win, right, Jay? Yeah, this was this was a like again, YouTube sold for 1.5 billion. We did the back of the napkin, Preston. We're like, well, if we have this much traffic and they have that much divide, did oh my God, we're worth a few hundred million dollars. And then worth nothing. Right. But in between those two companies was a company called WikiU. So on the heels of this, this was going to be shut down, a guy named Raj Kapoor, who was just a guest on my show recently, the founder of Snapfish, at that time, he was at Mayfield Fund. So he had one of his investors was Mayfield for Snapfish. He sold Snapfish for Reed was involved in this too, right? Reed Hoffman? Correct. Which came through Raj. And this is what I found. So the first time around, I have traction and I shun all the VCs and I go down with these entrepreneurs and and do I go down? (laughs) Right. And it didn't work out. (laughs) Right. And then I said, I got an idea. And I had this idea for a while, which was, and this is really interesting too, because uh, there was a, a notebook found from Mark Zuckerberg. And one of the ideas, I forget what he called it, but one of the ideas he had was basically WikiU. It was one of these things like we might do this. And the idea was he wanted to get more adoption for the social network. In the early days, it was hard to get people to join these things. They didn't join like they do today because there was a stigma about, oh, it sounds like dating or, you know, this is like early 2000s. And the idea was if you don't want to be on there, Preston, I'll just create your profile and then you'll claim it. <laughs> it's like a Wikipedia page, right? Yeah. So that was my idea. I had this idea. I always talked about it. And when I was a bolt, and then Raj Kapoor knocks on the door, calls us up, says, Yeah, I'm going to be in the city. You mind if I come by the office? Comes by the office. He says, I'm an investor in a, in a social network called TAG, T A G G E D. And I think it's called MeWe now or something like that. And so, but anyway, so he comes in, he's like, I'd like to merge you guys. So he was seeing an opportunity of distressed, a distressed company, merge these guys in, bring the founders in, merge the assets in, bankrupt the liabilities kind of thing. You know, this is a common thing that you see when a company has, has problems. We weren't open to that. I ha- happily flew out to San Francisco, met with Greg and, his, and John, his, his co-founder, and uh, we sat down at a coffee shop. They were real great guys and really smart guys. I think they went to Harvard. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I got one question for you guys. When we merge in, if this happens, who's the boss? <laughs> <laughs> the critical question. I was 26 years old. But I knew Aaron cared, right? Because Aaron's been <laughs> running Bolt since 1996, right? And this is like 2006. So 10 years he put into his life into this thing, right? I said, well, who's going to be the boss? And Greg's like, he looks over at John, Aaron looks at me, and, and I'm just like, well, what are they all going to say? <laughs> right? And I just knew that Aaron would never not be the boss because he is like a great CEO. He, he was that kind of guy. And uh, they were like, uh, I go, this isn't going to work, is it? And he's like, they, everybody at the same time, like, probably not. <laughs> it's just like we, all, we wasted our time flying out. So we, we come back to New York. Raj comes back the next week for another meeting. And he's like, do you mind if I stop by? I want to talk about the meeting. He already heard from Greg. He's like, I heard it's not going to work out. I was like, no, I don't think it's going to work out. I was like, we flew out to give it a shot, you know, the good old, you know, college dry. I go, but I don't think that was going to work out. Egos and stuff, you know? And he's like, but you got nothing. I was like, Aaron's like, Jay, tell him your idea. I was like, what? The, the wiki thing. And I was like, oh, why would I tell him that? And he was like, well, tell me the idea. I like you guys. Maybe I can invest in the next idea. I was like, really? Like he was new into venture capital. Um, and so he was trying to make investments, I think. And, and, and you, you really should invest in people, not ideas. Oh, right. No and so, yeah. so we were, Great entrepreneurs that scaled businesses. We demonstrated that we have the ability to do that. He wasn't execution wise, he wasn't worried about our ability to execute. There's a little bit of light in a bottle with every idea you have. Not everything works. But anyway, I tell him the idea. I said, This is my pitch. If MySpace is your autobiography, 
then we could use your unauthorized biography. And he was like, wow, I really like that. And then I explained how this would work. We'll get into the details. When you're raising money, by the way, I, I think everybody needs that. They call that a high concept pitch. You need a 10 words or less, like an analogy of some sort that mm-hmm. clicks. And they're like, I get it. And, and you want them to put the pieces together because they feel smart, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I got that. And if I got it, then everybody else would get it. And it has to be digestible and easily be repeatable to their other partners. So it was easy. We said, WikiU is the biography of every person on the internet. Everybody creates everybody else's biography. And in a world in which everything is digital and we can keep a record of everything, why is it that my mother, there's no record of her, and in 25 or 35 years or 50 years, her descendants, great grandkids and stuff, they'll never even know what she did or who she was other than oral, oral history. I think that's crazy. Like we live in a world where they have Wikipedia. So Raj says to me, he's like, I like it. I want you to go meet with a guy who might know a thing or two about this. And I'm like, all right. He goes, let me set it up. So we fly back out to San Francisco and we meet with Jimmy Wells, the founder of Wikipedia and Gil Pancina, who was the CEO. And, uh, and the real thing was number one, <laughs> will you invest? <laughs> right? And Jimmy's like, no, I can't. I was like, okay. Are you guys going to do this if we do it? Because I mean, they had the scale, right? It was just, there's no point in trying if these guys are just going to copy it. And I was like, and he goes, We don't control Wikipedia. It's like Bitcoin, it's decentralized, right? He's like, So at this point, it's open source, like everybody else is controlling it. So the community may do that. He's like, But I can tell you that's probably not going to happen, as you probably know. He said this to me, he goes, Because I create a profile for Preston Pish and I can do that because there's notable articles about you and all this stuff. So it has to be a notable person to remain there or the editors will take you down, right? So you just can't create profiles of people that there's no record of if it's true or not. And he's like, how are you guys going to manage the truth? I was like, yeah, we don't know about that. <laughs> we never figured that part out. That's why it failed. But Raj liked it when it got blessed that it's not going to be copied. We don't have to worry about a threat of competition from Wikipedia. At least we didn't think we did. It made sense to see if we can get some money. So, and then build it. And uh, then he's like, I want you to re- meet with Josh Koppelman, the founder of half.com. So, we meet with Josh, and Josh sold half.com to eBay. And I guess PayPal sold to eBay. So, there's like a fraternity of these guys. So, so he knew Reed, and he's like, I like it. I want you to fly out to meet Reed if you don't mind, go to the LinkedIn office. And if he invests, then I'm in. Convince him you got me. Okay, fly out there, told my pitch within literally, I'm not even kidding. I give that analogy thing. And I said, it's in a biography of every person on earth. And Reed's like this, I'm in. How much? <laughs> like, sort to of God. I had my laptop there and I was like, I went to open. I go, but I have a deck. Aaron goes, you don't sell someone who sold. So he <laughs> sold, went, exactly. I was like, I'm a young kid. I was like, I was like, wait a second. And, and then they start talking because they've been in <laughs> the 90s and they're like, oh, PayPal, I know this guy. I know that BC. They're doing all this crap. And I'm sitting there like this and Reed's looking over. And he goes, what's wrong? Aren't you happy? You got the investment. And I was like, I don't understand how. And Aaron's like, dude, enough. I don't understand. Just take the money and shut just up. And shut I'm like, up, Jay. <laughs> I said, I said, no. I, I, I got. I just, I just want to know how you've been able to. Because he was an investor in Facebook and Dig and like all these yeah. big things. He had like a hundred plus investments, and I like idolized the guy. You know, I was like, how did you do that so quickly? Like, like this is crazy. You're just spraying and praying. Like, what's happening? When the YouTube guys came into my office, I knew who you guys were already because he already knew like the competitors, right? Yeah. And they asked me to invest in YouTube. And I said, sure, I'll invest. Why don't you go meet with Roloff Botha over at Sequoia Capital? It used to be a PayPal. It's this whole PayPal mafia thing. Yeah, heard PayPal of, right? mafia, so, yeah. so they send the former PayPal junior level guys who are running a scaling product called YouTube from LinkedIn over to Sequoia. And they say, yeah, it's interesting. We'll make the investment. And I think they upped the valuation. And when we went back to Reed, they said, we're really excited. They said, yes, they'll do it. And here, but they want to increase the value. They want to increase the amount of capital going in, but without diluting us, they're just going to increase the valuation. And Reed was like, Oh, um, okay. I don't like that valuation. I think I'm going to pass, but don't worry. They won't not invest. I'll talk to Roloff. It's not a big deal, right? You don't need me. You know? He goes, I ain't making that mistake twice. Great entrepreneurs. Like there was actually a third co founder people don't talk about, Jaw Wed Karim, right? So there's the three co founders of, of YouTube. He liked them. He liked the market. He liked that it was starting to scale a little bit. And, uh, but he didn't like the valuation. He didn't He's like, like the That's valuation. So, Isn't that crazy? Like, it's so dumb. He goes, he goes, in the end, what matters in venture is getting it right. Because if it's right, it's multi billions, right? And and the only reason this didn't remain private is because of all the labels, right? That's why they had to sell too. Same issue that I had. You, you had to get out, or you had to deal with lawsuits. Because once you sell it to the buyer, YouTube had to deal with it anyway. I'm sorry, yeah, Google yeah. had to deal with it anyway, yeah. right? They just couldn't sustain it as a private company. That plus all the server bills and everything, right? It's just an unprofitable venture. So anyway, he passed based on valuation. He's like, I'm not doing that with you guys. So we raised the money. It's a half a million dollars, roughly, and um, 
never scaled it, right? It just didn't work out. We were cross promoting it off a of bolt, trying to migrate users over, and it was getting there. We had like tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. I don't even know how many it was, but it was thousands of people, not millions, you know? And it just didn't get there in time. And I went back and we raised the money in like late 06, going into 07. By the summer of 07, the iPhone comes out and we already built a product and we're, we're live. And we had a TechCrunch article and this and that. And they were comparing us to another former PayPal mafia guy who created Genie.com, G-E-N-I, genealogy kind of thing. And so, and I think it was David Sachs, if I'm not mistaken. So we were, we were competing with his site in the article, but we really didn't think of us, uh, think of ourselves as competing with them. But that's how Michael Ironton wrote the article. We're like, because it's like not good with other investors and stuff, you know? The long and the short of the story was we didn't get to scale. I went back to them and I said, I think we have to reshape this product to make it an app. And at the same time that summer, Facebook launched the apps that they called them, right? On Facebook. So I was like, we need to make it so that it's a Facebook app and an iPhone app. And on the Facebook thing, and I think anybody can do this, by the way, if you get a program out there, I think you should create WikiU. I think I would invest actually if they did it the right way, because I think it's a great idea and it still hasn't been executed properly. But the way to solve the issue that we had was we couldn't solve for duplicate profiles. I can create a hundred Preston, famous people like, like you, by the way, <laughs> and, I, and Zay, right? I was telling you, I just interviewed Zay the other day, Isaiah Jackson. A lot of you guys that have like hundreds of thousands of followers, you end up having all these fake accounts. Actually, Jason Williams does too, right? So I was yeah, talking to him yeah. about this. He's like, they won't verify me on Twitter. He's like, it's so yeah, annoying. It's crazy. I always mess with him because I haven't verified. Well, you would, I'm you like, would you're just not famous enough. <laughs> So, you would think the AI would be able to just pick up like the, yeah, it's kind yeah. of crazy to me, but. I was thinking like the problem we had was duplication and then the lying, right? Like, so I create a hundred profiles of Preston and we don't know what's real or not. I have a solution for that. It's called Facebook Connect. I don't know what they call it now, but when you log in with your Facebook, so we, can, we could set it up that a profile goes public when you create your own profile for, to be created, to be edited and created. And you do it through Facebook Connect. So essentially, once you have the profile up there, it can be edited by people either that you approve, people that are connected to you, or something like that, that you, that you, that you follow, something like that. So you have your family and friends creating your profile for you so that your biography lives on for your descendants or whoever else for the rest of the time. But we didn't get there. And I went back to reading them and I was like, it told them then, 2007, Preston, I was like, this is how we got to fix it. I, I see it now. I, I couldn't see it before the iPhone and the Facebook apps and the Connect and all that was there, but it was there. And I was like, let's. I need a little bit more money because we're running out. Of, we're running low. We had like 50 grand left. I was like, and we were trying to raise money as it was. And we went, on, went to the Sand Hill Road thing. We met with like, you know, Sequoia and Lightspeed Ventures and, you know, Klein or everybody. And uh, Jeremy Liu at Lightspeed, he was a friend of mine. He said, um, when we finally got to his office, he's like, it's great to see you guys here. He's like, I'm just, we walk into the office, sit down. He goes, you're not getting any money. And I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> he's like, just so you know, I've gotten 10 phone calls over the last day that you're meeting with everybody. This is how it works. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, all the VCs talk. Like, oh, did you guys meet with you know, WikiU yet? And it's like, no, well, Reed's introducing us. They introduce, yeah, yeah, I got a meeting with them tomorrow. It's like such an insider thing, right? A lot of entrepreneurs don't know this that aren't in the circle. They all are friends, all these VCs. They co invest yeah. in syndicate, you know? And he told me straight up, he's like, I'm just going to be honest with you. You're not getting any money. You should stop embarrassing yourselves going around the street because it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I go, why isn't it happening? I don't understand. And I told him the strategy. He goes, I love the strategy. But you have an adverse selection problem here. Why isn't Reed just anteing it up right now? The guy's a millionaire. If it's that good of an idea, like it's almost like they know something we don't know. And I was like, there's nothing that they know. He's maintaining his pro rata rights. They go, yeah, it's not enough for us. What they got for the last percentage and the amount they put in, they should just do the whole next round. Like, and the fact that they're not, I, I would syndicate, I'd be, I'd be a syndicate on that round, but they got to lead it. He goes, if you convince them to lead it, I'm in. But if you can't, you're not getting money from anybody. Yeah. So I'm back and talk to them. And they were like, I talked to Josh and Josh says um, from first round capital, he's like, I don't really know if that'll work or not. But like the way his mindset was, at least then he's like, fail fast. You tried it, you iterated, you built it, you had a couple change and let's just move on. I was like, really? So I had two failures back to back, <laughs> right? So Bolt goes under, sued, bankrupt, you know, ABC. And then I try WikiU and within like eight months, I run out of money. I'm a loser, right? So, but I had this idea. The stress I though. Idea. For people that have never tried entrepreneurship and they've always just worked for a company, like you just can't imagine the stress that's surrounding all this. I mean, it's just, it's nuts. And then it you're, is crazy. You're, there, you're there building late nights, just seven oh, days a week. Yeah. This new hardware on a phone came out and it just completely disrupted <laughs> our whole like plan. Right. And just, my Lord, stressful. And, and it was stressful, but I was young and yeah, I didn't you, have kids. Yeah. 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 And, you know, for, you know, I had a house and a mortgage and all that kind of stuff. And, but, but I didn't really, I, like I said earlier, I didn't care if I went to zero. I was never afraid of losing all my money. 
that wasn't a thing to me. As we know, they just keep printing more of it. <laughs> so I always thought that before I even thought about inflation. I was like, they make more money all the time. I could just get more of it. It's not like it's a zero sum. It's not like the money goes here and I can't get it. There, there's yeah. going to be more to make. And there's always opportunities. You can create new things. I was never afraid that this is a one-shot deal in anything I've ever done. That's just the way my mindset was. And I don't know where that comes from, but I was never afraid of that. I'm still not afraid. If I lost it all, I know I can make money back. I'm, I'm not worried about that. Anyway, long story short, that failed. And I go to my girlfriend who I met at Bolt. She's now my wife with four kids, right? And I said to Kate, I said, uh, I got an idea. She was our number one salesperson at Bolt. And nobody knew we were dating for a while when I was there, you know, trying to be as professional as I can in front of everyone. But this is all unwinding. The business is getting shut down the first one and the next one's not working out. We're not getting any funding. And I said, I got an idea. But I mean, the track record doesn't look so good right now, babe. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to trust me on this one. She's like, what's the idea? I go, so I kind of popularized video sharing. And it's happening on YouTube, but it's not going to be the only destination for video. You have to remember back in the early 2000s, if you went to CNN.com or Fox.com, they had subscriptions to watch the videos. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, I'm going to pay you to watch the video content because they didn't have a lot of video advertising to support it. I said, why don't we build a video advertising network so that we can, so they can be supported and there's no more subscriptions? Doesn't that make sense? And she's like, okay. And she was doing like 6 million in sales at Bolt. I was like, let's go, let's rock. So I went to her father, my now father in law, and I said, I said, will you meet me in Soho for lunch? You know, so we go into the city. I sit down with him. I said, I would like to ask for your hand in business. <laughs> and he's like, what's this guy about to say? I've only been dating his daughter for like eight months or something. And I'm like, and he's like, in business? What are we talking about? And, and Kate was here at the table. I said, uh, I want to go in business with your daughter. And I was like, and I don't want to do that without the consent. I don't need your consent, obviously. But we're dating. I'm close with the mom and dad and this and that. And aunts and uncles that go to Christmas and all this stuff. And I was like, I've had two failures back to back. I can't guarantee a success. I will guarantee you I'll give everything I got. That's how I am. And, and I'll work as hard as I can. I will work 24 hours a day. I will tell you there's going to be good times. There's going to be a lot of bad, rough times. And I was saying this to her as much as I was saying it to him that day. I said, so if you think this is because he was a teacher and his, and his wife was a teacher, and, and I think that in their mind, they're like, go to work and put in your, they put in 38 years and have a pension from their, yeah, their very time. And very, very different. Yeah. Totally different mindset. And he, I think he wanted his daughters to be teachers. Kate was an English. My wife was an English uh, major, you know, when she went to Boston college. And uh, so I think that was the plan. At least obviously she has a different outcome <laughs> you know, than she would have been a teacher because she did this. But I said, I, I go, the opportunity, it's an asymmetric risk thing, right? I was like, the opportunity on the upside is worth what the opportunity, what it is on the downside. Worst case scenario, Bob, is it doesn't work out and we just get jobs. That would have never happened for me, but for her, she maybe just got another <laughs> job. Right? Like, so he leans over and he's like, um, no eye contact to me, right? At this point, he looks at his, his daughter and he's like, so you know, Julia, whoever her name was, or that you went to high school, she works at Google. I can, I can reach out to her. I still keep in touch and you, and she, you know, they're always hiring. And I was like, hello, <laughs> was like, what are we talking about? I was like, Bob, are you saying you don't want to do it? He goes, I'm just, it's up to her. And I was like, okay. You guys talk about this. I know I'm doing this. It's either going to be with one of the guys, Aaron or Lou, or it's going to be with you. I'd rather be with you because I knew I wanted to marry her. You know, so I was like, so it, either way, like we're going to be together. You know, it's not like this girl and then you know and you break up in the middle of it. I knew I was going to marry her. I just didn't want to propose and get married in the middle of all this happening. You know, like you said, it was a stressful time. And so we did. We went down that path. We built it. And and my way to get into the, the what I believe that it would grow into, Preston, which it did. I didn't know where it would end because that's the iteration of adapting and evolving in technology. But I knew that we needed to start in a niche market that we can own. And so we at Bolt had that social network slash video sharing site, but we also had a good sales team there. And so we, we repped miniclip.com, if you've ever heard of that gaming site, the largest gaming site in the world. We were the exclusive sales force for them at Bolt um, for US sales. We also repped RuneScape and a bunch of other gaming, large gaming sites. So I said, well, you know, this is getting shut down, Bolt, right? It's going away. And uh, WikiU is gone, right? Like that, that's not going to work out. Let's just reach out to all the gaming sites and, and sign contracts with these guys, rep the inventory, and then we're basically an agency. I go, this is not that complicated. We have the relationships. We know all the advertisers and it, it, we just got to build a business around it. We did that initially, very services agency-like in the beginning. We would do homepage takeover banners and Things like they call them adver games, where you make a game. We did one called the Oscar Mayer Deli Creations, which is a thing they sell in the store, right? And and it was like the hands putting sandwiches together, you know, as you're playing. And you, you know, you click the, you, know, you grab the bread, and you get, you know, this whole, and it gets faster and faster, round by round, you know. And it was all branded Oscar Mayer. So we did a lot of that kind of stuff: craft, Disney, 
underoos, the underwear. Like we did all these games and I was like, this is terrible what we're doing. It was great. We're making a lot of money, right? It was very profitable. Day one, we were profitable the whole time we ran that company and the revenues were growing really fast. I thought year one, we'd do like 3 million in sales based off of what we did previously and the relationships. But what I didn't see happening, we started the company in July, I think it was August or July of 2007. By December, we had no sales, right? I was like, this isn't working out. (laughs) We finally get a sale in January of 2008. And in that first year of 2008, we only did $750,000 in sales. So it was basically me, Kate, and a couple contractors remote. You know, and I was like, this isn't working where I thought it was going to go, but it's an income and I'm making a lot of money and that's cool. But, but I don't see, hold on, I got a thing here. I don't see how this is going to scale the way we're doing it. I was like, we have to get to more automation. And this is before RTB, real time bidding and all this kind of stuff, right? It, before you saw the programmatic buying. But I knew that that's where it was going to lead to. And about a year or so later, like Pubmatic and Rubicon Project came out and some of these platforms. And we started to get connected with these platforms. We started to build technology with the profits. We hired programmers and we built out a real, Platform. And, uh, and then we changed the name to Yashi because it kind of had a, like a gamey Asian, it's an Asian name in India, a uh, female name. And I was like, it's got that Asian gamey ring to it. Almost sounds like Yoshi from the video game with Mario and stuff. And so the gaming community accepted the name. And then it was kind of like this just ambiguous name. It didn't mean anything. It was like, it's like Yahoo, you know? And what people didn't realize is that Yashi was owned by Yahoo at one time, 1995, they owned the domain name. So who knows? Might have been Yashi. So we started that business and in 2008, we did like 750,000 in revenue. By the time we sold it, we were doing like 36 million in revenue. So we just kept scaling and scaling and scaling and then it got, and it started to scale a little bit faster as we started to kind of automate things a little bit. Amazing. So I saw that, I saw that early on. I was like, this video thing, I don't think it's going anywhere. And a lot of websites and blogs and everything are going to want to monetize this. So we just got to lock them up, started in gaming. We moved outside of gaming and, uh, and then we went from like services to more automation uh, by the time we sold it. All right. So- Talk to us about the transition to you becoming a Bitcoiner. What was the time frame that this started coming on your radar? How did it come on your radar? Take us to your, I guess, core story. The first time I heard of, of uh, it's actually funny. I interviewed um, Howard Lindzen, first investor in Robinhood, put a million in. They went IPO today for a hundred million. I retweeted my interview with him today <laughs> and um, like, good for him, bro. You know, this is unbelievable. He learned about Bitcoin. And on an interview, I asked him and it reminded me of my story because it's so related. It's crazy. I said, how did, how did you learn about Bitcoin? Oh, no, no, no. This is the question I asked him. I said, what percentage of your net worth is in Bitcoin today? First, I said, the only. He said, yes. Like, What's your percentage of net worth? He says, too much. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> he doesn't want to tell me, right? I was like, okay, it's fine. I got you. you know? I said, um, is it because you just haven't sold it and it keeps growing? He goes, yeah, basically. He's like, I, I bought a a small amount a while ago, and it's becoming a larger. He's like, I probably should sell some of it. And I was like, no, 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 don't sell it. Just leave it alone, right? You did great. I go, but what's your favorite book on Bitcoin? Like Bitcoin Standard, Hard Money You Can't Fog Away. Like, what, what do you what do you like? You know, I never read a book on Bitcoin. I was like, what do you mean you never read it? What do you know about Bitcoin? Tell me what, what do you love? What are your attributes? He goes, eh, Fred Wilson told me to buy it, so I bought it. <laughs> I swear to God, wow. I was like, how did I learn about Bitcoin? Fred Wilson, not personally. I read his blog of VC.com. So the mm-hmm. first time I ever heard about Bitcoin was from a VC.com, Fred Wilson's blog. He was talking about it maybe in 2012, probably the first time I really read about it. But I was very skeptical because, again, I'm very skeptical of venture capitalists. Right? So I, like, I was like, well, why are they talking about this? What is the nefarious angle that they have? Like, are they, <laughs> right? like, are they pumping and dumping? And I can't imagine it's the Bitcoin itself that they're pumping and dumping. They want Bitcoin to grow because how are they going to make money? They're not going to just, as a venture capitalist, just buy Bitcoin and hold it for their LPs because so the LPs it's could do that. it's not own the Bitcoin. It has to be some tangential it's thing. It's some, it it's like BlockFi, right? It's like, it's all this other stuff, right? Like what, and that didn't exist then. But I was like, there's got to be an ecosystem that they're hoping develops and they're going to invest in the ecosystem around this coin. So I'm going to buy the coin like the sucker and they're going to invest in the company, make all the money. I'm not buying this coin so that you could go and create your companies, pump it, and then dump it into an IPO or an exit. I was like, that doesn't benefit Jay, me, you're right? seeing so, that right now. You're seeing this right <laughs> now in 2021. You're seeing people take that same mindset, right? They're like, yeah. it just can't be that easy. There's no way I can just buy Bitcoin. It it happen. It's like always going to happen. It's going to get worse as the price keeps going high. I know. Too. I mean, I'm saying this in 2012. Look at those prices, right? And at that time, there was two things that re- prevented me from wanting to get in. Number one thing was I thought, I'm not in the inside club of what's really going on here, right? So I, I just, that's how I felt. I was like- yeah, I got to figure it out. I don't get it, right? Yeah. I just, I didn't get it, right? For people in 2021, it's easier to get because you have places like Clubhouse to learn. You have the blogs, you have Twitter, you have Max Kaiser, you have Preston, you have all these people teaching you about Bitcoin. Nobody was teaching anybody about Bitcoin in 2012. 
it was this magic internet money, right? And yeah. it was like this nefarious thing that it, it felt like. And not only that, the market cap was so small. Oh yeah, it just didn't seem stable. It yeah. just didn't seem that. The, it wasn't about the price stable. per. The pr- I don't care about price per because I understand stocks, right? So that that doesn't matter. It's all, it's all about what it divides into and stuff, right? The market cap was too small. It's like this is nothing. This could go away, right? Yeah. Now I say that to people like Bitcoin Dean, and he's like, "No, it can't." I'm like, "I know it can't now." In 2012, it could have. Okay, so don't tell me it can't, right? Because it didn't. He's right, <laughs> right? So I'll give him that. But I just didn't believe it. So I was an idiot, right? I just I just didn't say it. So. Then in 2013, running Gamers Media Yashi, we had a customer, this guy, Francesco. He kept asking me every month, will you accept Bitcoin for payment? I'm like, nah, I don't know about that. Let me, let me look into it. So I start looking around. I'm like, well, how do you even sell it? Like, It just <laughs> didn't even make any sense, right? Like, How's this guy even getting this Bitcoin, right? Nothing registered. After like a month or so, I figured out what he was doing. He was buying traffic from us. We were driving visitors to his site through his advertising. He was buying from us, right? To push to his site. And then he was working with other ad networks and he was selling ads. So he's arbitraging. And I'm like, why is he paying me? Why is he insisting they want to pay me in Bitcoin? I never accepted the Bitcoin, but he kept asking. He was mining it. And back then you can mine GPU. So he was making a lot of money, I think. Oh, right? wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so he's getting like traffic for free, essentially, electricity costs, which was low. And right back then. And driving the traffic to him. And then he, in the end, he's, I mean, if I feel bad about not taking it, he's got to feel like an idiot today <laughs> that he was spending you, it as fast as he made it. Do you know that he was mining it back then? Or are you just yes. assuming that's what it is? Yes. So yeah, did he, did he uh, talk to you about that way back then? Yeah. Funny story. I went to his office once after like, the first payment didn't come in and he's like, no, no, you, he was Italian. He's like, you just take your payment. I give you Bitcoin. I transfer it. I go, no, 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 no. You have to send me a wire. No, no, no. You take it. It's okay. You take it. He's like trying to convince me by just saying, yes, I'll take Bitcoin. I was like, I'm going to come up to your office today. <laughs> I'm, <up the> <laughs> I'm not that far from New York. Right. I go up there with my wife. I go, let's go. We're going to go get to the city. We're going to eat lunch. And then we're going to go hang out with this guy. And he's going to wire me the money. You see me. I'm not a small guy. I go, oh, he's going to wire me the fucking money. <laughs> so I go <laughs> in his office. And this is no joke. And he's like sitting at his office and on the back wall, I didn't notice there was, there was all this stuff on his wall, but I walk in and I was like, there was like hundred plus people. It was, it was a content business. It was like a news website almost. I go, to the, I go into the office. I was like, where's Francesco? Oh, he's in the back. I'll bring you. I go, no, I'll go. I walked around. I was so pissed. I was like, this guy owes me $50,000. <laughs> I want my money. So I go in his office and I was like, hey, he goes, hey, Jay, how you doing? I go, I'm doing great. Where's the money? <laughs> he goes, I give you the Bitcoin. I go, there's no Bitcoin. I want you to wire me the money right now. I'm not so easy. I have to sell it first. I go, okay. I sat down. I go, sell it. He goes, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work like that. I go, we're going to go to lunch. When I come back, I want my money. Yeah. So I leave. We go to lunch, come back an hour or so later. He's like, I got about it, like, you know, a little bit of it, but not all of it. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, it's not so easy. I go, you want me to take this shit and you can't sell it that fast? No way. You wire this when I go home. And I'm like staying at his desk and I'm like, you know, trying to be like a tough guy. And my wife's going like this. She's like, and she's doing this. And I'm like, what? She's, her eyes are moving around looking at the, and then like the back wall. And he's talking, he's all half and he, he's leaning his back and she goes, no big deal. I, I sell all the Bitcoin. I give you the money. Don't worry about it. You calm it down. Calm, and I'm like, and what's she looking at? And on his wall are all these plaques and trophies for Taekwondo. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, you wire me the damn money, bro. You know? And he's, he's all relaxed, Preston, because he's thinking, I'll whoop this dude's ass in two seconds. Oh my Lord. And I'm like, I'm like, you wire me the money now. And he's just looking at me like, get out of here. But he did. And every month he would, he would convert his Bitcoin to, to fiat and he would send, send you the, the money. Man, do I regret that? Because I probably collected like two fifty to $350,000 from him that year. And probably 60% of that was profitable. That could have just remained in Bitcoin on the wow. treasury. I would have never done it. I had no regrets. Of course, of I, course. Yeah. You know, but that's my missing of Bitcoin story. When I got it was a couple of years later. So running Yashi for a while, Bitcoin's definitely coming on the radar more and more. People are asking me, I even have an email from a friend that worked for me. And he's like, what do you think of this Bitcoin? And I had those stories, you know, and I'm like, it's a scam. <laughs> I have this email, I have like a <laughs> screenshot of it on my desktop. It's a scam from me to him. I'm like, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> And I didn't think it was actually a scam. I was just like, it's speculative. It, it was weird. Yeah. I could only imagine yeah. based on that story you just said, like, how can you take that, <laughs> take that seriously? The thing is, there's, we know like Kaiser and all these guys, they did. Yeah, I no, mean, they did take it serious. Kudos to them, You're right. man. You're right. I didn't. And, and I don't know how they saw that because they don't, when you look at some of these guys, I don't know Max's background necessarily, but a lot of the others, what else have they seen? Nothing from what I can say. Like they got this. But they, like, they what else it. did they invent yeah. or create? Yes. Yeah. Like they saw it so early and I, my hat is off to all these guys. I, I have all the respect in the world for anybody that saw it way earlier than me, because I've seen things early, like social network, online video sharing, ad networks, a lot of the investments that I've done in angeling and stuff. I totally missed this one in the beginning. And I was like, when I finally clicked, yeah, it was Jay, like around the, 2015. 
five yeah. years from now, 10 years from now, people <laughs> yeah. are going to look back at you telling people You're so that early. You, missed, you missed it in 2021 and is going to be like, this guy didn't miss nothing. My first purchase was 2016, right? So I sold the company in 2015, January. Yeah. Now I'm just sitting around just chilling, right? The first, I was supposed to work for Nexstar for two years, six months in from the buyer who bought Yashi. Um, I called the CEO and I was like, I want to quit. <laughs> and the guy's like, to Perry Zook, the CEO, he's like, what are you talking about? You can't quit. I was like, yeah, I can. I, I don't want to do this anymore. You, you, you told me you would work for two years. I don't know anything about Yashi. I go, but I, my guys, they know it. No one's going to screw you. Like everyone's going to stay. I could be an advisor, whatever you want, you know, but, but I don't want to do this anymore. He goes, why? I go, because you have, you've taken over two of my conference rooms with auditors every day. I got people bringing me and my executives in nonstop, asking me questions about revenue recognition. I go, I can't do this. He goes, but you have to I go. No, I don't. I sold. I'm done. I don't, this income that you're giving me, which was a nice income. I don't need it. I don't care. So yeah. I'm out. So he's like, all right, I'm going to come to the office tomorrow. I was like, tomorrow he's in Texas. So he's like, I'm jumping on the private jet. I'm there tomorrow. I was like, okay. So comes there, we go to a diner, we hang out. And he's like, you can't quit, dude. I was like, what do you mean I can't quit? Are you going to sue me? He goes, I'm not going to sue you. I'm just telling you from an integrity perspective, you said, I'll give you two years. I was like, oh God. And I have integrity. I was like, you're right. I'm sorry. I go, I just don't want to deal with this. Nice Can move. I step down? That was a nice I, move. He, he's smart, right? <laughs> That's why he's the CEO of a $5 billion company. I'm not, right? I was like, can I just step down and, and make my number two, which was this guy, Scott Hoffman. Um, he was like the 70th employee at Yahoo. No, so he's got a lot of experience. I go, just make him the CEO or president, whatever, and just make me like an advisor. advisor. He's like, he goes, listen, if you stay home, like, and I don't live that far from where the office was. I live on the water over here in, in Times Zero. You're going like, to lose your mind. Beauty. You're going to lose your mind. Yeah. He, he goes, but because listen, he goes, he, and I did, right? He goes, if you stay home, you can go in the office whenever you want, but I'll give you the opportunity to just kind of just chill you know, at the house. But you want to talk about petty? He's like, but I got to cut your salary down. I was like, I don't care, dude. You don't even got to pay me, Perry. He goes, no, you have to be on payroll because I need the NDAs in place and the non-competes and all this non-disparagement, all this stuff that we sign. You know, He's like, that's all got to remain in place. I go, dude, whatever you need to do, right? Six months after that, they called me up. They're like, would you resign? <laughs> I was like, what? I you. And I was like, why am I resigning now? And they were like, well, we're merging in with Media General, they, like the two major we got a new guy. <laughs> and they and they were like, they're gonna be like, who are these guys? And like you're just staying home on payroll and you don't do anything. Yeah. Unless yeah. you want to start coming to the office. I go, no, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm happy to quit. <laughs> so I wanted to do about a year ago, you know. So long story short, with that is uh after I quit, I had a lot of time on my hands. I'm hanging out with the kids, playing with toys all day. And my wife's like, you need to do something. I was angel investing and all that kind of stuff. Bitcoin keeps coming up the radar. And I'm like, man, did I miss this? Because I'm watching the price movement. And oh, I was yeah. like, I got I to gotta get in. So I make my first purchase 2016, start buying in 2017, 18, and so on. What was your narrative for owning it? Just like you were watching the network grow or what? I was watching the price action in the market cap. I know this sounds so stupid. It doesn't yeah. sound stupid at all. I think for most people, that's the thing. It's like they hear about it yeah. two or three years ago from some crazy friend or some person who just wouldn't shut up about it. Yeah. They know what the price was when that person was there talking about it. And then they reassess three or four years later and they're like, Hoddle tells me, I, I become pretty good friends with Hoddle, right? And, yeah, and he tells yeah, me, yeah. he's like, it takes three touches, in his opinion. Not everybody's yeah. the same, but it's like that third touch is when you're like, what am I doing? I got to go in. The first touch, I forget what he said, the exact, I wish he was here, I could say, it. but the first touch, it's like, this is a scam, right? The second touch, it's like, I missed it. And the third touch is like, I better get in before I really miss it. You know, it's something yeah. along those lines. And, and he's right. Like the first time I saw it, I thought, ah, it's highly speculative. It's not going anywhere. I could lose all my money in this, right? The second touch, I thought I was, I was like angry about it. And then the third touch, I was like, I can't be an idiot here. Like I, I got to do this. So I, I got, I didn't, I didn't put a lot in in 2016, but I put some in, I put a little bit more in. And as everybody will say, I should have put more in earlier. As you, you know, and, and what happens is every time I buy, I buy more and more and more as it goes up in price. And I found because I had angel investors in Yashi that were Wall Street executives, like hedge fund guys, this is how they buy in the stock market. And a lot of, a lot of people don't realize this, particularly in Bitcoin, because now the new money coming in is a lot of institutional money in Bitcoin. And I kind of have an idea the way these guys think. They buy on momentum. So what we've been at oh, for yeah. the last few months, it's sideways. And it will remain this way until the catalyst goes one way or the other. They're either going to short if it starts to drop, or they're going to go long as it starts to go up, because nobody yep. wants to miss the momentum. That's just the way it works in Wall Street. And that was kind of the way I started to think about it. I was like, I, I got to get into this. I'm not worried about it dropping because it wasn't that low to begin with. And I definitely saw that this has the opportunity to scale in terms of like network externalities, which is most of my businesses were based off of. I got that. What I didn't really understand until probably in the last six months, becoming friends with Hoddle, 
I kept thinking of it as a network effect business like social networks. And Hoddle's like, no, 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 no. This is a monetary network, not a social network. We could have 500 people in this thing and it could be worth $10 trillion because of all the billionaires just put their money in, it goes up, right? And I was like, I thought of it that, but that seems really unstable if it's a small number of people, concentration risk, you know? But he is right. It is a monetary network. It's not a social network. So when people say there's only like 100 some million people that own it, it that doesn't matter. It's the, what matters is the substance of the people that own it and the dollars they're bringing to the table because every dollar is the participant, not the people. Yeah. And I think he's using a more extreme example in what he's saying, but I agree with him 100% yeah. in that people that want to deal in exchange of value in a unit that can't be debased as that trust in that system and that it, it's unmanipulable moving forward, you're just, you're just going to have more people that want to participate in a network like that, especially if the underlying value keeps appreciating because more and more participants want to want to use it. So yeah, I'm with them. What I didn't understand earlier on, on Bitcoin was the stuff that's the most important stuff. Like when I started to buy, I mean, it's crazy. I was yeah. buying it and I didn't fully understand. I think most people do that. They buy when they don't fully understand Yeah, I agree. and they buy out of FOMO and all this other stuff. Right. And then you, when you own something, that's when you really start to do your research on anything. Right. It seems at least for me, I don't, I researched enough before I buy something, but once I'm in it, I'm really researching because my money's in it now. Right. So now I have risk, right. There's risk capital involved. And uh, what I didn't understand early on about Bitcoin was really like that it is the hardest money, right? That part like totally escaped me in the beginning. I just saw it as like, as if you were buying like a stock. It sounds so silly, but like, that's kind of how I thought of it. I was like, yeah. this is an asset class that's taken off, right? But when people talk about the shit coin, which I never got into, the only thing I ever bought was Ethereum because it was a real close, not close, but first as anything else, it was a close competitor, right? And I was like, well, it's not so clear to me what will end up winning. And the, and the Ethereum argument made a lot of sense to me because whether you believe in the DeFi movement or, or not, there is an ecosystem built on top of Ethereum, is my thinking at the time. What I didn't realize is that it's not truly decentralized. And yeah. that part escaped me in the earlier days, right? I sold all my Ethereum, right? But I had Ethereum. It was my second, you know, there was, I had probably 20% Ethereum in terms of the dollars invested and 80% in Bitcoin. It's 100% Bitcoin now. I've never bought any other of these shit coins. I just thought, again, just like the VC is calling me, obviously, I don't know enough about what's going on. Uh, what I realized now, it took me years to figure out, last year or so, is um, it's the pre sale, right? Like the VCs and all their inside buddies are getting these things at like under a penny and then they, they bring it to an ICO or it goes, goes public essentially. And everybody mm -hmm. else, they're dumping it on them for like three, four, five cents or 10 cents. After they market the living hell out of it. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it's like, and, it's, and, and, and they're like, oh, we're, we, their coin does this and that. I've learned this through like the guys on Clubhouse, actually, the narrative at least uh, against it, which totally makes sense. They're creating a marketing scheme of, of some sort to get you to buy in around some technology. But what they're saying is it, it, that it's based off a of blockchain, but it's really just a database because it is mostly centralized, right? All these companies, right? The thing I ask people when they talk about shitcoin, whatever, is just what, what application that is currently exists on the internet is this token or protocol going to try to, to replicate, but on the protocol layer, where it has a, yeah. native, a need for a native token. So like, what is that application that it's currently <laughs> replacing? And like, anytime I ask that, people just like, they, can, they look at me and they're like, they don't know what you're talking about. Like, what are you even talking about? So like, let's say Twitter wanted to tokenize a coin and for anybody that wants to advertise on their platform, they'd have to buy the Twitter coin in order to, to do that. Like that would be, and, and I think that in the end, that's going to lose, even if uh, you know, a large platform that already has a massive user base tries to migrate and port all their users over to this protocol that would be doing this stuff. I think it's going to lose in the long run because I think there's going to be such a massive network effect for, for Bitcoin in the long run that it's just, it's, they're not going to be able to compete. The anyway, other day, Amazon, we're, we're digressing, but I'm a happy yeah. deal. But like the Amazon, Amazon said, well, we're not going to accept Bitcoin payments. And then the fear that I was hearing on Clubhouse, uh, verbal, I love Clubhouse for that reason. You kind of hear what people are thinking, you know? Yeah. And they were like, well, they're going to create their own token. And like, those all, these are people coming up from the audience. And I'm just like, but it's no different than having credits. Like on these websites, have been yeah. doing this for years. You, put, you buy credits and then you use your credits with like music sites and all kinds of. So if they create a coin at Amazon, it's not transferable necessarily outside of their ecosystem. And even if it does become transferable outside of the ecosystem with a wallet and stuff, it has to get adopted. And even then it's centralized, centralized. right? Bingo. It's yeah. centralized. Yeah. At the end of it all, it always goes back to it's not decentralized, yeah. right? And but, that's the key that it escapes a lot of people, I think. But that's the thing that I guess the whole reason I brought that idea up, and, and I don't think that it would work long, 
long term for scaling and centralization purposes. But like the reason I yeah. bring that up is like that's the question to ask. It's like, so what application, because you'd call it Amazon, Twitter, whatever, right? That's the application. What application is this shitcoin replacing that would, would then become a protocol that requires a native token? And when you ask that question, it's just like, you can't answer it. It's just crickets. And, and look at it doesn't, what Jack- doesn't exist. <laughs> look how smart Jack is. He's trying to incorporate Bitcoin sats yeah. into Twitter. I, I don't know what the timeline is for that, but he knows that that's where all roads lead and he's just cutting to the chase. He's not trying to tokenize anything. And I know we're about to get into a conversation we probably shouldn't, but like the other day when Kathy, Elon, and Jack yeah. were talking, it blows my mind that, that um, Elon is still promoting and saying he owns, even if he owns Doge. Like, it's just, just crazy. This is the thing I don't understand. This is the part that I can't understand. This is how I rationalize it is... I think he just wants to see something weird and yeah. something uh, non-standard that's, that's goofy and kind of like thumbing his nose at like the system and like the status quo. The status quo. Yeah. yeah. I think he wants to just see, like he would find it really funny if Dogecoin became like a Doge <laughs> because of but that this is, alone. Yeah, but this, I know it's not. Well, he's definitely weird. I mean, I'm weird too. Right. But <laughs> But the weird thing, and this is where he's weirder than me, right? The weird thing is like, if you look at all of these other influential people that have come before him and before us, right? Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. I just think of like these titans, right? Like who has ever went out publicly and said, I'm really invested in this highly speculative thing. They probably have been invested in highly speculative things, but they felt a personal responsibility to the public to not tell people that they're yeah. invested in highly speculative things because they'll copy them thinking, well, he's smarter than me. Yeah. And this is where Elon, if he's listening to this podcast, can't imagine if the clip ever gets to him, you're going to wreck people if this doesn't work out. And you should feel some responsibility Probably already for has. that. Yeah, he already- I'm yeah. sure he has. I'm yeah. sure. And it's like, I think I almost feel like he's doubling down because it was a joke. And now he's trying to act like it wasn't a joke for like maybe the, the CFTC or something. I don't know. You know. He has such a massive platform that could be used for good in the impact, yeah. in the education. I think that's frustrating, Jack. Yeah. And, um, and it's just kind of like, Hey dude, like you got to have a little bit of like responsibility here or feel a little oh, bit yeah. of an obligation to all these people. I mean, dude, his account is massive. Look, I got a few rules that I kind of live by really simple ones. Integrity is important to me. Yes. Most important thing, most important thing, integrity, empathy for others. I have a relentless kind of behavior that I, that I, it's why I was able to do what I did. Cause I worked nonstop. 10 to 15 hours a day, seven days a week for, for eight years, right? On the last company, not including all the other ones before. You have to be like you do, like yeah. you're putting in the hours, right? You got to do that. Pattern recognition is really important, right? For, for business and stuff. I said it earlier. I, I think that's key. Win-win solutions, I think are really key too. Like you try to seek a benefic something that's beneficial to both parties or all parties involved. And a lot of people, I've been, I don't want to name, name names or anything, but there's been people I've done deals with in the past and they don't. Not everybody like operates. That. They yeah. don't operate this way. They're yeah. like, well, it's beneficial to me and my family. I'm not trying to hurt you, but you know, I think that one's huge, and I think so many people miss the mark on that one. Yeah, and and it's important. What they don't realize is is when it's not a win win, and it's just you winning and crushing the the soul out of the the counterparty. Like there's there's some type of force in nature that destroys your win through that. I'm sure right. I just firmly believe it. I don't, I don't know how to describe it or what it is, but like the people that are so, I mean, it's selfish nature, right? It's just, this is what I'm leading to. The selflessness is another one. Yeah. And if you die tomorrow, what are they going to say about you at your funeral? For Elon, they're going to say a lot of great things, but on the Doge thing, there's a footnote, unfortunately, and there's going to be millions of people that lost their life savings, I think. And their life savings to him is a joke, right? Their life saving maybe $10,000. This guy's the richest man in the world. And he's like, oh, come on, they can make that again. But dude, they might not. And some people may even commit suicide over this kind of stuff. Who knows? Like, I, I just, there's some responsibility of treating people with the respect and dignity that you should be treated with. And, and, and you can't think that everybody's as smart as you. And I'm not saying that you should assume everybody's stupid, but I don't think that it's a stupid versus smart thing necessarily. I think it's a in the know versus not in the know. And people are looking to him for guidance and, you know, well, we can move on, but I just, it really does bother me when I see what he's doing. 
I saw somebody commented on Twitter that you think the timeline for Bitcoin potentially becoming a unit of account is way out there to the right. Explain this to me. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. It's kind of like Amari's law where people will say you overestimate things in the short term, but underestimate things in the long term. And I think that problem with the Bitcoin community is that we're living in a bit of an echo chamber and, um, and we're very, very bullish, right? I try to, I try to uh, remove myself from this all the time and everything I've ever done. That's why I was able to do the things I was able to do because I, don't, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm not an Ivy Leaguer. I don't have pedigree, right? So I'm humble enough to recognize that about myself. So I'm constantly trying to learn. And what I've seen with the Fed is I think Amari's law applies to the Fed. Now, the Bitcoiners will say it applies to Bitcoin. And that is true. I think in the long term, now comes down to time preference, right? And, and are, are you saying what's long term, right? Because I saw the tweet today that you would both yeah, get tagged well, so in. And I was well, like, yeah, define it. I'm 42 years old. I say my lifetime, I'm talking about the lifetime that matters, right? If I'm 80 or 90 and it happens, maybe, I don't know. You know but I'm just saying like in my working years and like the years that matter over the next 20 or 30 years, I would say, I don't see it happening because I think that people underestimate the ability of the Fed to keep this going as long as they want. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think that the Bitcoiners believe that it's all just going to collapse overnight. Max says that the dollar is going to collapse in, in August. He was saying this on Clubhouse two months ago. I was like, well, you're, you're living in your own like you're drinking your own Kool Aid. Like I, we all want to see these kind of things happen because Bitcoin goes through the roof, right? So you're just—it's like hopium, like the Bitcoin community has. And I love all these Bitcoin maximalists, like, but I think that they're underestimating that the Fed can keep the party going longer. And I'm not saying they can keep it going forever, Preston. There's no question that's not going to be the case. And I might be the one that's wrong on this. I just think that they've—it should have failed a long time ago, based off of what's happening. It should have failed in 2009. And they inject the money. 2018, they inject the money. 2020, they inject the money. They're buying $120 billion in bonds every month right now. This is crazy talk. I mean, when you really think about it, everything is completely fake right now. The stock market, real estate, bonds, it's all fake. And we all know it's fake. And we know that the inflation numbers aren't even real. And the Fed even just said something the other day. It was like, well, you know, that's <laughs> like, wait, I don't know the exact quote he had, but he said something along the lines that it's not a real number almost. And I was like, it was interpreted that way when I read it. And I was like, what the hell are we, what kind of bizarro land are we living in? And when I talk to people outside of the Bitcoin world, which I do a lot, friends of mine that are doctors, lawyers, smart people, wealthy individuals. I bring people on my show. I brought Greg Olson on my show. This guy sold his company. He sold his company at 48 years old, I think for $600 million, bought it back for six, then sold it again for $60 million. I said, how much Bitcoin do you own? This guy's like, Bitcoin. I don't own any Bitcoin. I'm like, why not? He's like, I don't need to own Bitcoin. People don't realize if you're that wealthy, you actually don't need Bitcoin. And when I say that to a maximalist, they go, oh no, he needs it. I'm like, no, he has time. He, yeah, has, he time. has time. He's invested yeah. in assets that are inflating with inflation right now. Yeah. So he has time to make that decision in the future. And that's why I'm trying to explain when I say it's probably not going to go to a unit of account in our lifetime, or it's going to be so far out. Some of these guys think it's in 10 or 15 or 20 years. And I'm like, you want that to happen? I want that to happen. Clearly, we have a vested interest and we're aligned. We'd love that to happen. But I don't necessarily see that happening because I don't see the adoption from everybody who has the money. Because again, it's a monetary network. You need that money to believe. And it's not as simple as saying like, hey, I give this to my two-year-old and in like five minutes, he knows how to use it. 10 minutes, right? He's using an iPhone. So I show him how to use YouTube, but my six year old using YouTube all day long. These are simple things. Simplicity works in tech, Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever, Google, like it's just a simple input search box, right? Like this is not complicated stuff. That's why it scales really quickly. This is complicated. I'm sure you could admit you don't know everything about Bitcoin, but to the average person, you know 99% more than most people, and yet you still don't know anything about Bitcoin, right? Like to me, there's a learning curve that needs to come understanding about money and monetary policy. And it, most people don't know anything about this. Even people have a lot of money though. And, and that part, I wouldn't say it's worrisome. It's a slower adoption than I think people believe. I like your point. And, and if I was going to summarize your point, it's really kind of like Larry David. It's like, curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> like, like, just pull it back a touch. And you know what? If, if you're wrong, so be it. You're able to plan around and, and kind of not be so dependent on this crash happening for you to materialize yeah. like all what all your expectations are and what the performance is. If I was going to push back on what you're saying, I think that your argument there at the end was it's going to be really hard for users to onboard and fully understand what this is all about to bring it to the to the table. I don't think that's where the value appreciation of Bitcoin actually comes from. 
I think the value appreciation of where when Bitcoin goes from a hundred thousand to a million to ten million yeah. per coin happens through a just total meltdown in fixed income. So as as fixed income and, and when you think about user count compared to fiat value, there's a handful of people that are controlling hundreds of trillions of dollars in fixed income. And so what I think I guess why I think the timeline is is pretty fast. I think in the coming 10 years. And the, I guess the reason why I think it's happening, going to happen. By faster, the way, I hope you're right. Cause yeah, a lot of Bitcoin. No, no. <laughs> and it doesn't, you know, either way, so I'm not like anti-Bitcoin in any way. Yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't matter with either one of us are right. But the, uh, I guess what I think you're going to see is as they're continuing to compress these fixed income yields down to, I mean, they're already at nothing. You've got a little yeah. bit of nominal yield here in the U S still, but it's mm-hmm. getting so compressed. And then you just look at the trajectory of how much uh, fiat's being added into the system, you're going to be down to zero. You're going to start going into negative rates. They're going to try to take it even more negative. And I think there's going to be this point where, especially if the price appreciates to 100,000, goes to 200,000, where people in the fixed income space are going to start to say, all right, I think I can see how this story might actually start to end here. And I need to start, I need to stop allocating so much into these these contracts that are a guaranteed loss of capital if I hold it through maturity, which is based on just this further hopium Alice in Wonderland kind of scenario that's happening out of central banks. And I need to start putting at least one to five, whatever percent yeah. into yeah. Bitcoin. And I think once that, once that trust is lost in the fixed income space, those few people that control so much of the capitalization of that asset class start transitioning it over, I have a feeling that it's going to happen quickly and it could, it could happen at a timeline that's fairly abrupt. I'm with you that that is, and I believe that that a little bit stronger in the beginning of the year when Saylor and uh, uh, Ross Stevens had their, um, I forget the name of their conference that they did that was remote. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What was that called? I forget the name of it, but they, they were teaching people about Bitcoin basically, yeah. right? And, um, and that's when, um, you know, by the way, I think Michael Saylor has been great for Bitcoin. You yeah. need more people like Michael Saylor. We don't just want one, but we need more people like that. And the Bitcoiners have said we don't need anybody. But I think you, you do need people like you and, and, and Michael, because I think you take a complex problem and you, you simplify it for people. You explain it in a simple way that they can understand and in, in a coherent way, right? And he does a really great job. He talks about oh. $400 trillion in assets. He's amazing. And he, he's, it's like his brain is moving. like he's, It's like he's reading a slideshow in his head. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> right? It's unbelievable. I, I want to get interview this guy so bad. It's like, God, can I get him on my show? <laughs> I love this guy. But he's amazing, right? Um, and the narrative makes sense. It all makes sense. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question I have is the timing of it, right? I'm not saying that institutional money is not going to go in. I had Anthony on my show as my first guest, and he was talking about a wall of money coming in from Wall Street. And, and the one thing he said that was just like simple, taking complex things and making them simple, rather than get into all the intricacies about Bitcoin and the strengths of Bitcoin and all that. Here's a simple one for the average public. He goes on CNBC says all the time. There's 21 million Bitcoin. There's 48 million millionaires in the world. There's not even a one Bitcoin for every millionaire. That's a pretty simple thing to say, right? The only thing Anthony could do something. Like, right. It's like there's not even a it's like you're sitting at the at the uh the baseball game at the Yankee Stadium and it's like, who wants a hot dog? It's like, you know, it's supply and demand scarcity kind of thing, right? Like they all want the hot dog, but I only got 10 of them here. It's like it's the same idea. And so I get it. I get that. But Wall Street's really smart about figuring out how to create new products to sell that will replace the fixed income bonds. And they're starting to do it at Blackstone. Warren Buffett said it years ago in 2009 collapse. He's like, man, what I'd really like to do is go buy a bunch of single family homes. And it's well, like, yeah, that's, why would he say that? Isn't this crazy? That? Isn't this crazy yeah. what they're doing? So when you think about like how this plays out, the fools at the table are the ones that are issuing the fiat at nothing percent yeah. interest rate, right? And so think about BlackRock. I mean, they're a fixed income house like at the core. <laughs> and so like, you're, you're like, they're the patsy at the table here. And now I understand like they got all these, these policy type things that they've got to do to get the yeah. money out the door that the Fed and the, the government is, is kind of putting on them. And so when it, just recently in the last six months, when they started buying all these homes down mm-hmm. in Texas and they're- like, The whole neighborhood before what pre-sale. Are, so pre-sale. Exactly. What are they doing? They've stopped being yeah. the patsy at the table by issuing the, the fiat that they're going to get paid back is worthless currency over a 30 year period of time at a fixed rate. And they've at become, a fixed rate, yeah. And they've become the owner of the equity so that they can adjust the rent rates 
That's as, exactly right. As annually, the, the uh, dep- inflation as the inflation and the debasement occurs on. I had Grant Cardone on my show, and Grant and I had multiple different conversations on uh, on and off offline, you know. And he's obviously a real estate guy, and and he's I got him to buy Bitcoin, by the way, just so everybody understands the Bitcoin community. I got Grant Cardone <laughs> to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I convinced his ass, right? Because when it dropped like twenty nine thousand, he gets on Clubhouse and he's like, "Jay, you be proud of me? I bought a bunch of Bitcoin today." <laughs> this guy's funny. <laughs> Who knows if he really did? But he told us all. <laughs> But he's been saying that America is going to turn into renters. Americans are yeah, going to go no away doubt. from home ownership. It's going to turn into renters, right? No. Gary Camp said this, obviously, and, and Travis for, for Uber with car ownership as well. But he's been pushing, pounding the drum on the real estate side. And he said, I'm going to sell. He has $2.5 billion of assets under management right now with all his properties that he has um, at Cardone Capital. And his buyer, he said, will be Blackstone someday. He's like, but I don't have the scale yet. It's got to be way bigger, right? Two and a half billion is not enough. It's got to be like oh, 10 to 20 billion. Yeah. It's, it's got to push the needle, right? They just went out and raised six billion dollars from investors to buy up single-family homes, like you said, so to replace and sell debt instruments. Wow! Right? Like, wow. This is crazy, right? So, so uh, no, no, you know, Blackstone. I said did the six billion, right? So Blackstone just gets oh, the six oh, billion oh. and it says, yeah, not Grant, right? Grant's I Grant trying to get the six. Running them. <laughs> the point was that I'm getting to is there's a hundred and was it 118, 120 trillion dollars in debt globally. This is sailors' numbers, and I think 18, 20 trillion of that is un, is negative. Effective real rates of returns are negative, right? That money's not going to... So, so my bullishness in the beginning of the year after hearing sailors say it, I was like, wow, that's really bullish because that money has to come into Bitcoin because they're yield chasing and they're not going to get a yield on Bitcoin, but the appreciation, if you look at the history of it, but that's a big bet for a bondholder to say, we're not looking for a yield anymore. We're just going to buy something for the appreciative gain on the going forward. That's not what bondholders like to do. They like to get a yield annually off of the asset that's that they purchased. Against inflation. And that's yeah, and that's in, and that's real estate. And I think the first, this is where the slowness happens of the adoption. I'm telling you, right? I think that it's something that I didn't foresee happening. I couldn't see that coming. That they're just going to buy up houses. They're going to, but they're going to keep finding things they can buy as an asset that gives them a yield until they've ran out of everything with all the money they're getting from the Fed. And then what's the last thing to buy? It's, it's going to be Bitcoin. That and I'm not going to say it's, I'm not saying everything's first and then Bitcoin. I'm saying they're going to start doing this to dilute what could have been Bitcoin adoption. They're going to do other things that we're all in the Bitcoin community saying, what are they doing? <laughs> like eventually yeah. everyone's going to do a run on housing, right? And buy Bitcoin. That's what you and I believe, I think. They're going to be the ones holding the bag. But to your point, they could just, the asset, underlying asset value of the real estate isn't actually important to the bondholder. And that's in sense. It's, it's about, like you said, the adjustment on the, on the rents for their yield on the inflation as it's changing year to year. And that's the most important thing. I went to some of my investors about three years ago and I said to them, I want to get into triple net real estate. I want to raise a fund because they had contacts in Wall Street. And I was like, let's go out and raise like $100 million, 50 to 100 million bucks, and we'll buy triple net. We'll buy corporate, a Starbucks corporate run properties. You buy the land, it's triple net. They pay for all the maintenance of the, for the audience. They pay for the maintenance of the building. They pay the property taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So you, you do nothing but collect money, basically. This is great. And it's a fixed product. It's better than a negative interest rate from a bond of course, because you're getting 5 6% yields on these properties. And what they said to me was, if you look at the history of the way assets have worked for the last 30 plus years, in the early 80s, we had like 20% uh, interest rates. They drove all the way down to 0% by 2009. And the guy said to one of my own investors, like, if you took a ball and I threw it at the ground, what's it going to do? It's going to hit the ground and bounce off. He goes, and that's what rates are going to do. I go, no, the Fed can't raise the rates. And this is three years ago, right? Yeah. This is before- yeah. You're dead right. This is, this is after 2018, right? So I saw the crash in December and then it popped right back up, like bang. As soon as the Fed went on 60 minutes, Jay went on 60 minutes and, and calmed everybody's nerves, bang, the markets recovered instantly, like literally instantly, right? The next day. And I said, after I saw that, and by the way, just to be clear, uh, 2015, it sold the company. This is how I'm very intimately familiar with this. You're sitting on this pile of cash that you windfall and you had to risk it. I had to buy stocks and equities and Things like that because after they were up over yield, 150 year, 200 percent at that point, yeah, I'm taking all this money and I'm putting it in a savings account, yielding me like 0.1 percent. What yeah. are you kidding me? A tenth of one percent? That makes no sense, right? So like, I wasn't doing that. So anyway, some of the money was in that, unfortunately, but like not all of it, right? And so I just believe, to be honest with you, Preston, that you're going to see money moving into real estate and other types of vehicles. They're going to create vehicles. It's what they do. Wall Street creates products and vehicles, and then they sell it to their constituency. right? And, and that's just what I see happening before I see full adoption to Bitcoin. So that's why I'm saying unit of account, bro, we're a ways away from like pricing a house in sats if you don't have every, all the money moving into it first. Because I'm not saying you don't get to a multi-million dollar coin first. What I'm saying is, and this was the tweet you got today, 
The yeah, tweet was, Jay doesn't believe we're going to account. a unit of account. Yeah. I was explaining this to my wife as I saw a tweet. We're at soccer and I was like, look at this one. I showed it to her. Right? This is before earlier today. And I said, this is crazy. Like, Imagine looking around this room right now, Kate, and you're so conditioned that everything you look at, you're like, oh, that's 50 sats. Oh, that's 200,000 sats. Oh, the, no. Like, This is crazy town. This is maximalism at its best where you're in the echo chamber and you're visioning and projecting out where you see things will go. But the rest of the world isn't. You have to have the rest of the world doing that. That means you have to have a market cap that goes up, but you need adoption. And again, market cap can go up before you have unit of account. No, I totally Because you need everybody thinking this way, right? So we can get a multi million dollar coin. I'm not saying you don't get there first. I'm saying for everything to be priced in Bitcoin, you need full adoption. You need a major collapse for that. It doesn't prevent somebody from using Bitcoin as a unit of account for how they value everything on the planet today. Me personally, the way I run my business, the way I think about investing in equities in general, Bitcoin's my unit of account right now. Like that's right, how I do right. valuations. And let me tell you, I'm not saying this to brag. You can you can give me whatever investor you want. I'm pretty sure I've clobbered them over the last <laughs> five sure. or six years, right? <laughs> so and and I truly don't say that to try to like sound egotistic or, or yeah, whatever. No. I'm saying it because once I made that shift to looking at everything through the lens of that being my unit of account, I go back, I look at the Apple top line oh. revenue. I'm going back and reverse engineering it so that I'm looking at it in Bitcoin terms. And guess what? The top line at Apple for the last six years has gone down every <laughs> single year when I value it in Bitcoin. The, ca- yep. the free cash flows, they've gone down. So when I'm doing a dollar discount, you know, discount cash flow analysis on that, and I'm looking at a trend line that's trending down, it's yeah. real easy for me to do. I do the same thing, Preston. I, yeah. I look at like, when I sold my company, had I moved all of the proceeds into Bitcoin? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a multi billionaire. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a multi billion dollar number. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, why did I not do that? Yeah. But I didn't <laughs> because of fear and uncertainty and doubt, right? Like, just be honest, right? Like, that's, that was the reason why I didn't do it. Didn't have the conviction and understanding that I have yeah. now. But anyway, long story short is I do believe we'll have a multi million dollar coin in, in the next 10 years, right? I believe that. I just don't think I'm going to be pricing, not me, but I don't think people will be pricing the world. Yeah, I can buy that. The one thing that I want to say for people that are listening to, our conversation about the real estate piece and BlackRock stepping in and buying the real estate. I don't think this is a good thing for society. Like, no. I, I want that to be very clear. Like, we're kind of laughing and joking. And, like, to us, it's just really obvious as to why this company is doing this and why any other big fixed income house is probably trying to, to put those, those quote unquote positions on of buying people's houses. They're going to bid the prices of real estate. And it's just going to, it's going to be a mess. But this is a company that is reacting to the, the policy decisions that are being made on a global yeah. scale. It's not that they're trying to be bad people. They're just trying to protect their equity holders by making sound decisions to protect themselves against future debasement. It's happening in the double digits based on M2 money supply growth. And like, they're just reacting, just like everybody else is reacting, just like you out there buying Bitcoin are reacting to yeah. the circumstances of what's being dealt. So I, d- I just want that to be clear. And I know Jay feels the same way. Is like One thing I wanted to tell you that I agree with, it, that it's dangerous, is that what's going to happen, I believe, is that there's like $40 trillion in value for single family homes in the US. So from a perspective of the negative interest rates, they could probably suck up a lot of that dollar shift from the negative interest rate of bonds over to real estate. So if there's $40 trillion, you're not going to get all the single family homes in the US, but can they get 10 or 15% of the single family homes? And then when there's a cataclysmic collapse and the bailout comes from the Fed, they're going to own our houses too. They're yeah. going to own our bonds, yeah. our houses, our stocks at some point. The government's going to own everything if this keeps on. Like yeah. you, you can't allow this to keep... We have to they're vote national- this crap out with politicians. They're nationalizing stop. everything, yes. but they're doing it in a fractional kind of way where mm. they- Very slowly. Just yeah. slowly. It's not like, oh, we now own this company. It's like, no, we own 5% of this company. Now we own 10%. Yes. And now we just own everything. It's yeah. crazy. And like the bonds, I'm not so worried about because they have maturity dates. So that you don't own the bond forever, right? They'll eventually, yeah. they'll probably not sell them off the balance sheet. I don't think they'll ever sell the bonds that they've been buying, the $120 billion a month. They'll yeah. just let them expire as maturity date, right? Yeah. Then, which is fine. They will come off the balance sheet based off of duration. So I'm not too worried about that. I am worried that the next leg will be that they start buying equities because they bought ETFs for bonds. They're going to have symbol. Yep. They're going to start buying the SPY and everything else. And then yep. the next thing will be when there's a major collapse after all these hedge funds start buying up real estate, they're going to have to buy their houses because they didn't work out. And then they own all their houses too. 
like, what are we doing? Like, this yeah, is scary. Gross. We need Bitcoin. They're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna own the bag sack. <laughs> so to your point, you might go to hyper Bitcoinization much faster if the collapse happens in the next 10 or 15 years after they bought everything up and you have the major, major great reset. Honestly, I love your point, which is curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, let's wrap this up. Give people a handoff. I know you're active on Twitter, but if there's anything else you want to highlight, uh, give them a handoff. Dude, I love this conversation. This was so much fun just jiving on business and entrepreneurship and all this fun stuff. So yeah, yeah well, the one thing we didn't touch on, I'm an angel. So if people are you know looking to for investors, you hit me up through Twitter on a DM. I have my DMs open. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter. You'll probably have it in your bio or something like that. But um, it's J A Y G O U L D. You can find me there. But outside of that, like I'm not operationally running anything. I'm just an investor. That's it. Jay, thanks so much for making time and coming on. I love the chat. Thanks, Preston. Appreciate it. Hey, so thanks for everybody listening into the show. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to subscribe to the show on whatever podcast app you're using. We really appreciate that. And if you have time, leave us a review. So thanks for joining us this week and we'll catch you next Wednesday. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.